Hey, Dumpster Dwellers. Welcome to part two of our Michael Ray Bauer interview. If you haven't listened to our latest episode, 312 The Willies, or the first part of this interview, you might want to jump back and go do that before you dive in. To everyone else, kick back and enjoy. Gordy Belcher, hold it right there. Why? Is it too hard for you to shoot a moving target? I'm not going to shoot anybody. I don't even have my gun with me. I suppose you're going to want to invite me in for tea? Yeah, so uh, let's. I want to. I want to just kind of put the needle back a little bit and talk about a little bit about Dude, Where's My Car, and, and then we can roll right into Evolution too. Yeah. Okay. So, Dude, Where's My Car came along. Um, like I said, I think I was running a little successful in the the entertainment industry world, and um, I worked a lot of jobs at Fox, you know, and that was a Fox movie as well, a stoner movie. Uh, so again, the casting directors, you know, heard of me, know me, or I've worked a lot of movies at Fox. So apparently maybe I'm, I'm pretty good or I'm on somebody's wall over there. But I get an audition for Dude, Where's My Car? And I, I did audition as one of the leads. Uh, uh, I think it might have been the, the Sean William Scott role. Which one was that? Is that Chester? Yeah, yeah. Sean is Chester and Ashton is Jesse. Yep. Yeah, so I auditioned for the Chester role. And then I got a, we have a casting session called Mix and Match where they bring in a lot of quality actors, you know, like that are being considered for the role, you know, cause you have to present differences to casting directors and producers. You get it. Every actor is different. You know, they do it one way, they do it another way. It, it, it's all different. I went in, Seth was one of the people that auditioned for this movie as well. Seth is in the audition. We didn't really talk that much that day cause we're in work mode. You know, you don't, you don't really want to fuck around or pal around when, when you're you're in one of these big auditions, you know. Yeah, you keep it professional. Also, you scared the shit out of them. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was earlier. <laughs> but you know, you just respect each other when you see each other. You're like, oh, what's up, Seth? You know. Sure. Yeah. So we went in. We did some rehearsals. We mixed and matched uh, with Ashton, Sean, uh, this and that. I didn't get the part, which is fine. Uh, but then about three weeks later, the director, I guess, calls me in for another role uh, as like a cult guard or like a security guard member. So I go into the audition and because it said security guard or something like guard, I decided to, um, I wasn't bald. I had hair at this time, but I decided to shave. I had a little bit of a beard. So I made myself into like a seventies porn star guard where I had just a mustache, <laughs> you know, like, a, and I looked kind of like a seventies fat porn star. You had that big old mustache. <laughs> yeah. I had that big old like burly mustache, man. <laughs> I just, I don't know what I wore. I think I wore like a, a flamboyant like seventies button up shirt. And I put it like a fake security badge on it or something. I don't know what I did. Uh, but I walk into the audition and then it wasn't a lot of lines, but I saw the director again, Danny rest in peace. She passed away. Danny liner. Oh, he also yeah. directed, um, what was that hamburger movie where they buy a hamburger? Oh, Oh, Harold and Kumar go to white castle. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. He also directed Classic. that. Cause that, cause they didn't do a dude. Where's my car too. That's why they, they went out and made um, Harold and Kumar. So I, I go to the audition and then he tells me, you know, do my part, this and that. And he goes, just be you, blah, blah, blah. So I read all the lines and then I leave. Uh, and then all of a sudden I'm getting in my car and then Danny's running to my car. Michael, Michael, Michael. I'm like, yeah, what's up? He goes, dude, you blew it. He's like, you blew it, bro. He goes, why didn't you give us your lisp? He goes, you were not, oh, no. he goes, you were not funny at all. He goes, why did you take away your lisp? And I go, I, I don't know. I just thought like a guard, I have to sound tough. So I purposely tried to get rid of my lisp. And he's like, Mike, I told you to be yourself. He goes, dude, come back. Just be yourself. And, you know, let's do it. And then he, 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 he goes, love your outfit, by the way. So I went back to the audition. Then we filmed it again. And then I just talked to myself, you know, whatever the lines were. And then, you know, I got the job. It was like three weeks of work. You know, then I went to the set of Dude, Where's My Car? Had a fantastic time. Uh, and there some issues cropped up. Again, my life has issues for some damn reason all the time. So, but 
I worked with Ashton and Sean, met them. We were building friendships and chemistry. And then what's the name? Hal Sparks was on that. The girl that was on oh, 24, yeah. 24 was on that. There's some amazing comedians that were in that damn movie. Uh, but Ashton made fun of me one day on the set. And I, oh boy, I had to walk in the room basically naked after they steal the interstellar jump shoots or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's just like plastic with like a little, what was it, like a purple leotard or some shit like that? It was like bubble wrap. Yeah, it was bu- bubble wrap. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you the bubble wrap story after. But so there's a scene where we get our jumpsuits or bubble wrap stolen and we have to run into our cult and we have to say, oh, they stole our jump shoots. And then they're like, no, we didn't because they stole the bubble wrap to, you know, get into the cult. And me and uh, what's his name? Uh, I want to respect him enough. He's an amazing actor. Uh, Bill, Bill Chott, forgive me, Bill. We have to put um, these like skin colored shorts on our body because we're basically naked. So they, <laughs> they, they made these skin colored like onesies or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, I'm very, I'm very insecure and I'll be honest, I don't mind saying it, but I'm very insecure with my body parts, you know, like, so, but we have to wear this and then we have to put a, like a fire extinguisher in front of it, but we have to stand around on the set in front of Jennifer Connelly. I mean, Jennifer Garner, excuse me, Jennifer Con. I love Jennifer Connelly, by the way. Oh dude, she's wonderful. Jennifer Garner and the other actress, you know, we're like naked on set, you know, waiting for them to shoot basically naked and i'm feeling like ashamed or a little bit you know weird so then we finally start shooting and i don't know what ashton tells the two cameras that were on us so we go to shoot the scene we run in oh they stole our jumpsuits and then ashton goes no we didn't we didn't steal your jumpsuits and by the way you have a small penis he says something to that effect calling out me and like a small piece that means he's looking in my junk area or he saw it on the side, but he made a joke out of it. But then the cameras were told to like zoom in or go on me for my reaction. And it wasn't in the script. And, and to me, that was a little bit of an insult. That's a little cruel. It's, it's yeah. all fun and games and all that other shit, you know, to them. And once it happened, you know, the crew's laughing, everybody's fucking laughing from behind the scenes. The cameras tried it. to zoom in on my reaction. Then I, I, I walked off set. Uh, I just literally said that was ridiculous. That was bullshit. You know, this and that, because just it was, I was really ashamed. Yeah. It's fucking embarrassing, dude. Like, dude, I don't blame you. That's embarrassing. It's uncalled for. I know, but we had everybody on set. Like we had Jennifer and the other girl kind of like upstairs, you know, we were like doing the scene because the cameras were free to move around and, there was like two or three cameras that were going to just get a bunch of shots. You know what I mean? Well, it's almost like if he wanted to shock you, he could have said anything. And he said that. Yeah. But still, it was it's just a little bit harsh. But, you know, like so I walked off set and I said I wasn't going to film again. And then, um, you know, Ashton came out. and He literally sat me down, apologized. and He's like, bro, I'm just a silly idiot. He goes, now that I see how it affected you. And then I told him, I go, dude, there's I go, Jen. Uh, what's her, her father, Garner? I go, that's his daughter. She's upstairs. I go, you know, I'm trying to have a career. You're making fun of me, like, in front of all these amazing comedians. How, you know, I go, bro. He's, yeah, making you look like a chump. Yeah, it ain't right. He's like, dude, I, I didn't think that far. He goes, I'm just an idiot stoner making a stoner movie. And we were trying to do that for reactions. So I, I forced them to, like, not leave it in there or whatever. But he apologized. And, you know, we moved on. But again... Mine and Ashton's future didn't get bad. It got better, but I was involved, like in his life with his girlfriends, even after the fact. It's, it's kind of crazy, but he always apologized. He became a better man. Well, that's good. All right, so the jumpsuit. So we had to each one of those spacesuits or the bubble wrap. They co- apparently cost around six hundred dollars to make, like six to eight hundred dollars uh, each. The bubble wrap suits? Wow. I know you wouldn't think that way, but again, it's Hollywood. Everything's more expensive. Yeah, sure. You got to hire a dressmaker or somebody like that that's never done yeah. it before, and they overcharge or whatever the case is. Plus, sure, they, had, yeah. they had to get my body fittings and all that, so that's time mm-hmm. and a half for the the make or the 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 wardrobe person or whatever. But so they they made the suits. So on day one. For me and Bill, we were like at a farm out, I don't know if it was Lancaster or something, California, but it was like a 98 degree day, like 100 degrees. Whoa. And we're on 
in the bubble wrap for the first time, not knowing how they're going to make our body feel. And we're out like in the mountains where there's more sun and everything like on a farm area. Oh my God. So we were just dying. And then we had to stop production then as well. Uh, Cause they had no Gatorade. The doctors kept oh, saying, man. Oh, you, you need electrolytes. You need electrolytes. And we almost passed out me and me and Bill. And we're just like, this is bullshit. So we stopped production. We said, we, we go, you guys need to get us electrolytes. And we're not filming anymore. Cause this is, this is hell. So they went out and they bought Gatorade, you know, stopped production for about 45 for somebody to get Gatorade or something. You know, you'd think they'd have that shit on set, dude. You know what I mean? Did, I mean, the, the doctor had, like, packages of electrolytes, but it wasn't sure, enough, yeah. you know? Like, we needed more. I mean, you get heat exhaustion and shit, too, you know? Everybody's different. They keep handing you water, though, but we were like, water ain't enough, man. Yeah. We need more. Whatever. We ended up filming. So then they went back to the drawing board. Then they figured out a way to make, like, vental, vental holes in the suit. So when the other actors came in, you know, wearing the bubble wraps, on a sound stage or whatever, they now had, you know, like ventilation holes and everything. <laughs> and so they learned that <laughs> they go. learned that from us. So <laughs> that's an interesting story about those things. And now the bubble wrap suits are literally a Halloween costume. You can look it up online. They're like maybe like fifty bucks online. You can buy a bubble wrap Halloween costume from Dude Wish My Car every year. Zoltan. <laughs> Zoltan. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thinks Hal Sparks with Zoltan. They're, they're not watching the movie right. We were praising a guy named Zoltan in reference to the Church of Scientology. Hal Sparks <laughs> is like the leader of our group, but he's not Zoltan. We're saying Zoltan, you know, like in praise of the almighty Zoltan. They dropped all those coffins in a volcano. It's, it's, it's <laughs> And I had hair for the audition. So when we started filming, I came on to set completely bald. And then Danny was like, what the hell? Like, I went bald again. And he's like, he's like, why did you go bald? I go, I read the script. I go, we're like cult members, and we're, we're doing everything to praise um, Zoltan. And then we got those two blonde guys in the script that they say, you know, they told us they made a joke in the movie, in the original script, that su- said something about they cut their ball hair, where they said Zoltan told us to cut our, our, our ball hair. I think it's still in the movie. I'd have to rewatch it again. But there was a joke that said something about Zoltan. You know, we have to do rituals for him. And, you know, he told us to cut our ball hair. I, <laughs> I distinctly remember that gag being in the movie. Yeah. So in my mind, as an actor, I was thinking I'm a follower of Zoltan. He told everybody to cut, to shave their ball, uh, their, their peepee hair. <laughs> I'm so stupid that I thought my head is my bald <laughs> head so i yeah. shaved in honor of zoltan i shaved my entire head as my balls so, so i shaved my entire body for zoltan so that that's what i told danny liner he's like why are you bald like you had hair and the mustache and i go because you know zoltan told us to shave our ball hair and he goes what i go yeah my characters would do it for zoltan he goes oh my god that's fucking hilarious <laughs> Nobody knows it. Like, you get it? Nobody knows the backstory or nobody gets yeah. that joke. So when you see me bald, it's because I thought it was my penis hairs and I did it for oh, Zoltan. Dude, Man. they must fucking laugh extra hard at that every time they see that scene. What I, I don't I think Danny was the only dude that knew. Like, I don't think oh, any man. of the other cast knew why. You know, they're just like, oh. Here's, you know, idiot donkey lips, you know, <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, that reframes, that reframes the entire sequence. Yeah, totally. Yeah, looking back, man, that was a, that was a fun movie to film, man. So during the filming of Dude, Where's My Car? Ashton Kutcher was filming a thing called APK, which is like Associated Press Kit, where they do press behind the scenes or whatever. And it ended up on the DVD uh, where he walks around and talks to some of the cast or whatever. But Ashton was doing a scene and he goes, he goes, Bauer. Because he knows that I always tried to have a camera around me. Like, I was filming a lot back then, trying to film everything. He goes, here, he goes, t- t- while I'm filming, take take some video or film APK or whatever. Right? So I start walking around for maybe half an hour with his camera from Fox. Uh, and then I filmed Jennifer Garner walking, you know, to the trailer. I'm like, hey, Jennifer. She waves or whatever. It ended up in the footage, by the way. That was me filming. But then I walked around that blonde girl. I forget her damn name, but she was in the movie with Charlie Sheen where she's in a car and they're driving away from the authorities 
Uh, she was the blonde girl. She played Christy in Dude, Where's My Car? Oh, oh, Christy, Christy Swanson, dude. Uh, Buffy. There you, there you go. Buffy. Buffy. Right? So I filmed her or whatever, and she got put on the movie last minute. Like, when she came in, when I first met her, they were like, thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you for coming in on last minute. Thank you for coming in or whatever. So I think she took the role last minute or whatever the case is. But I filmed her with the APK for a little bit. I walked up to her. I'm, I'm like, Christy, say hello. This and that. And then she like looks at me and she just walks away. Oh, man. Then a little while later, Ashton comes up to me and he goes, what did you do? Uh, Christy's mad at you. I go, I don't know. I just walked around and did what you told me. He goes, I don't know. Christy's a bitch. Anyways. <laughs> I'm like, all right, whatever, dude. Because she didn't want to be filmed, you know, when she's not ready or this or that. Totally, whatever, yeah. whatever the situation yeah. is. I'm like, oh, dude. It's like another damn X Files story. It's ridiculous. I get in trouble like on accident just for being me, man. So <laughs> I went over, I apologized to her. I said I was doing it for Ashton. I thought it was okay. He said might go around and film people. And she and then she just she just didn't really talk to me. She's like, oh, it's okay. Whatever. But she, you know, she complained to the producers or whatever. And then on the final day of filming. At the arcade, I told Ashton, Sean, and everybody if I can get like a, a selfie pic. Cause like many vlogs were coming, coming into the scene, you know, like you'd have a free vlog on like Microsoft.com slash Bauer or something. They'd give you like a free web page. That's what they were called web pages. So everybody loved Sean because he was Stifler and all that. And I'm like, Hey man, can I get a picture with you? Everybody loves you. I got a web page. Can I get a selfie? This and that on the final day. And then he's like, yeah, of course. So I take a picture with him, Ashton, whoever. All right, boom. So I post it on my webpage. I go, final day, uh, you know, of shooting Dude, Where's My Car? But I did it after the movie comes out. Yeah. I, learned, I learned that from the X-Files. All right, so the movie comes out. Now I get the job into Evolution. Yeah, so the audition process for Evolution was interesting. There was a movie called Road Trip. Yes, oh, I remember yeah, that right. one. I know Road Trip. A- around that time, the Road Trip might have been done after Evolution. That's from Todd <laughs> Phillips, which is Ivan Reitman's protege. Oh, really? Wait, his? Yeah, Todd Phillips made Road Trip. Todd Phillips was Ivan Reitman's protege during the making of Evolution and all that other stuff. So he was on set like a lot. I have pictures of me and Todd Phillips probably on my Facebook, but... He was on set a lot. So that brings in Ethan Suplee and Road Trip and whatever. Okay, so long story short. So I, I get the audition for Evolution. I go through like two or three auditions. And um, then I get told that I'm in the running. And they go, we need somebody to play your brother. Somebody that kind of looks like you, acts like you to play your brothers. Because we're called the Brothers Donald. Um, Danny Donald, whatever Donald. Then they said, Michael, right. they go, Michael, do you have a list of actors you've auditioned against? or quality actors, you know, that we can maybe play your brother. So I wrote down a list. And of course, you know, Ethan Chaplee's on there. I think Rory, I forgot his name. It's not Rory, but there was a couple other actors like Charlie Talbert. I knew him. He played Angish. Uh, There was a few other. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a few other fat actors like Sean Weish and all that that I worked with that I wrote on that list. So I handed, you know, the casting directors like that list. So my agent's like, you got the part, bro. If they're asking for people that plays your brother, you got the part. I was like, I don't know. I don't know about that. But still. So then I get a call for like a fourth audition. And now, you know, they said they're going to have people to mix and match. And I'm thinking it might be some of the actors that I listed to play my brothers. But I didn't see any of them. Then, oh, you know what? That's wrong. Charlie Talbert was there. Charlie was there. Um. So we get in the rehearsals and I start rehearsing and they don't know what they want. They don't know if they want skinny kids or fat kids or stoners or just stupid people or like California surfers. Like they don't know the chemistry for the movie just yet. So, you know, they're going to bring in all these different types and see how we work together or whatever. So I get this like for my audition, I, I didn't get Charlie or any of those people. I get this like he, he ended up doing the Dell commercials. He was like a skinny kid that did the Dell commercial. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, you're getting a Dell guy? Smoked too much pot and lost the job? Yeah, I lost two jobs to him back in the days. <laughs> no shit. Another one with Anderson. What is the guy from Seinfeld? The little, small, short actor. 
Louis Anderson. I don't know what the hell. Oh, uh, Jason Alexander or Jason Alexander. That breaks motherfucker. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I lost a job to the Dell guy many years earlier to Jason Alexander and his pilot. Uh, but again, so the Dell kid's in there and he's like, oh, good to see you again. Cause I met him many years ago. So we start rehearsing the scene and in the scene, like the town of Arizona is like being exploded with aliens and, it's kind of like a war zone. They're like, oh, the town's going down. It's being infected. And we're having a party scene. And I know Ivan Reitman. I'm a fanboy. I know Animal House. I know I'm in there because I remind Ivan Reitman of Bluto from Animal House. Or I sure. remind him of the actor from Saturday Night Live that passed away. Oh, John Belushi. Yeah, I know that I remind him of one of those characters or both of them. So... We have a party scene where I'm screaming. I'm like, Arizona's going down. I'm dancing. I'm saying my lines. Oh, there's an alien. You know, whatever. So I, I'm rehearsing the scene with the guy, and he's acting cool, like too cool for school. He's like, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> totally different kind of energy. Well, I bought a Dale. <laughs> you know, whatever he's doing. And then I, I wasn't liking it. But again, I can't tell him what to do. So we go in there. We do the audition. Then they say, can you guys go back? And, and, and then the, the casting director and Ivan are in the room and all that. Todd Phillips is in there, too. And then they go, could you amp up the energy? But he says it while looking at me, but they're trying to tell the other actor. But they're looking at me. They go, hey, could, right. you, bring, could you bring it up a little bit? They don't want to be rude to the other actor where he feels singled out. So they, they go to me, can you bring it up? You know, And then he goes, kind of get on pace with like what Michael's doing. It is the end of the world. He goes, you could still be the, you know, the dull stoner type character, but, you know, you're enjoying the end of the world. You're enjoying it. That's what they said. So we go out to the hallway. So we start doing it again. And I'm like, yeah. And then he keeps doing it the same way. I mean, he amped it up a little bit, but I know for a fact what Ivan Reitman wants. Ivan Reitman wants Animal House. Yeah, Toga! Toga! Like, I'm not, I'm a fanboy. I know what he wants. So I start telling him, this is what he wants. Do it. And then he's like, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, I bought a Dell, whatever his lines were. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like pissed off. So we get into the room. We do it again. Then they stop us right in the middle of it again because they wanted more. And he goes, we need more. We need more. So then I grab the actor and I'm right by his ear and I go, come on, the end of the world. I fucking love it. I'm a member of Satan. I love it. <laughs> and I'm trying to yell at him to get his energy up. Sure. I busted his eardrum. Oh, oh no. my God. <laughs> so apparently we did the scene, I guess, after he walked to his car and his eardrum is bleeding. This is now my fourth <laughs> audition. I go home and then I get feedback uh, later that night. Michael, uh, what did you do? Apparently the actor... <laughs> He went to the hospital with a broken eardrum. He's bleeding, and the production has to take on the cost to, of his hospital bills and, and give him some, like, pain and suffering or whatever. I'm like, uh -huh. are you kidding me? They're like, you can't do that again. And I'm like, okay. I go, what do you mean again? Oh, well, they want to see you again. <laughs> hey, it worked out then. So I'm like, all right. So a couple days later, I guess I'm going in again with more actors you know, to mix and match. But I was given the note to make it less and not do that again and whatever, you know, not be that crazy as they called it. Sure. All right. So whatever. So we get to the audition. Um, then again, but nobody was with me this time. I don't know. Go figure. So I get into the room. I'm like, nice to see you guys again. And I go, so none of you guys want me to be crazy again, but I brought some fucking beers. I go, let's go. Let's do this. And I brought in a beer and then I poured it because in the scene it says I poured all over my body and I poured it. I'm like, yeah, let's go. And then they're just looking at me. I did the scene. I, why am I going to change it? They want me to come back. They like what they saw. I'm not going to change it. Of course, I'm not going to yell in somebody's ear anymore well, and I'm going to be yeah. a little bit less. <laughs> But they were, like, confused or, or weirded out. I don't know what happened. So I go home. And normally, sometimes I get the job right away. And I'm at home for, like, three or four days now. And I'm like, damn. I know it's close to production. 
I know they want me because I saw a board. They have a casting director board with like the, the actors that they think are hired already on a board. It's called sure. like the, the actor wall where they put the pictures on the wall and you can see how they come together. And my picture was on that wall on that last audition. So I'm like, damn, you know, I, I got the role, but I didn't hear nothing. Then I called my manager and them. I'm like, what's going on, man? Something's happening. I just felt this pit in my stomach, like that I offended somebody or something. And then they called me up. They're like, yeah, they just don't know if you can be funny. They said they know you can be crazy and loud. And to some people that's funny, but they don't know if you can be funny and play a character beyond all that screaming. I go, that was the feedback I got from Ivan Reitman. So I took that to heart. I'm like, oh my God. So that day, that night, I was all alone. I pulled out my camera. I still have a little bit of the audition tape. I'll send it to you guys behind the scenes. But I decided to film the entire scene with me playing every character. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> so I'm like the David Duchovny getting out of the car going, hey, guys, you know, the world's ending. Then I play the other brother, the other brother. And I put it all together and edited it. And I had no friends. I had to do it outside of my house at like one, two o'clock in the morning. I had to light it because I heard, I heard the stories of Elijah Wood and people like that taping the, like their auditions. So I was like, I got to show them I'm funny, you know, that I can play other characters and be funny. So I really did it. And then I delivered it. You know, I paid a delivery service the next morning with an edited version. Um, I think it was like maybe a, Tuesday or Wednesday morning the next day. And then, you know, they got it. Then I told my agent manager, did they get it? Did they get it? And they're like, yeah, they got it. Um, and they said, they're going to, they're going to, you know, contact us or something soon. So then comes that Friday. Then I, I got the call. Oh, Michael, here's your itinerary. You're going to go to Arizona. You're, you're being booked for, I think it was 95 days or something like that. I got the part. That must have been a fucking weight off your shoulders. You should have blown everybody's eardrum and really made an impression. <laughs> so, you know, I got the part and then a couple days, you know, maybe like four days later after I got the part, get the itinerary. Oh, we're going to have a read through at, at, um, what was it? Not Amblin. It was DreamWorks. Excuse me. DreamWorks mm -hmm. was just opening up at the Glendale offices. Um, cause those were the producers of that film. It was DreamWorks and Ivan Reitman. And it was supposed to be like the new Ghostbusters for the next millennium. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, we had a read-through um, in Glendale. So I, I take my, my Ford Explorer with all my TV screens <laughs> <laughs> uh, down to the read-through. I'm like, oh, my God. So I go to the bathroom before the read-through. I don't really know who's really cast. And then all of a sudden, I'm taking a piss. David Duchovny. <laughs> <laughs> After kicking me off the set <laughs> of X-Files, Starts taking a piss right next to me and looks at me. And then he, he like does a double take. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, it's me. I'm that guy. And then he's like, oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, I didn't say anything bad. I was just like, good. I go, I'm here for a read through of evolution. He goes, oh, shit. He says it just like that. Oh, shit. You're going to be in evolution? I go, yeah, I'm playing um, like Danny Donald or whatever. He goes, oh, so we better become friends. <laughs> Don't film anything, please. Just keep that camera out of my face. So hilarious. So we sit oh, down man. to do the read through. We're waiting in the office and then we're about to start it. We're all sitting there. Man, I got Juliana Moore. She was just in Boogie Nights. I saw her naked. I'm like, look at yeah. I'm like, damn, Juliana Moore. I just saw you naked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then I'm working with Sean again. Sean saw me. He's like, oh, you're in this too? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, it's awesome, brother. How you been? You know, like, so we're sitting there and then Ivan Reitman comes in. Then they said, we're waiting on somebody. We're waiting on somebody. I'm like, all right. Then all of a sudden, like three people walk in, like guards or something. Spielberg walks in. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay. So now this is where we get to a side story that'll make this truth make sense. A long time ago, I used to sneak on sets when I would go to Universal Studios. I had a pass or I'd get auditions where I'd get to go to the offices and have an audition. And then I would sneak sure. on to, I would sneak onto stages and I snuck on the Jurassic Park set. They were not filming. It was just a big tree where the car came down, but the tree was in the middle of the stage. And it ended up being the scene where the car comes down and the little kid. Um, mm -hmm. But I saw that iconic scene. Correct. But one of those days that, you know, I, I would go to universal studios a lot. I was driving in my car. I was making 
a left. I was in the left lane, and then we had lanes to the right. So I'm, I'm waiting at a red light. I'm right, right near Amblin. I can't explain Amblin and his studios and all that are all right there. And there's a lane to the right of me just sitting still at a red light. My window's complete. My passenger window's completely down. Then all of a sudden, I look to my right. The other window of the car, right to the right of me, just looks at me. Their window is down because they're in the driver's seat. Again, it's like that. It's Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> this is before evolution, before. So I'm driving home. So I'm like, oh, my God, that's Steven Spielberg. And he noticed me. Like, his window is down. And he just looks at me for a second or two. And we literally locked eyes. Then, yeah. <laughs> by the grace of God, or, you know, Obama, or, you know, whatever. What's that other religion? <laughs> Allah. <laughs> yeah, or Allah. By the grace of Allah, or God, whatever you believe in, the light turns green where I, I'm in the end of the lane where I have to make a left. And then they would go continue forward. So right when the light turns green, I look at and he's still kind of like there. And you could hear me because he's that close to the car. I point and I go, I'm going to work with you one day. And then I just drive off. <laughs> so now, now we're at the evolution dream work stage. We're having the read through the area. Spielberg walks in. You know, he starts waving hello. I guess he's going to give a speech because it's one of their first movies. Him, I guess the other people were there too. Geffen or whoever. This was like. There was only three or four movies in production, like right. This is right when DreamWorks was starting. You know what I mean? As it opened, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were trying to make their blockbusters like Shrek and and whatever. It was like their, their first five movies. He walks in there, and, you know. He waves to everybody, you know. Then they, they greet they greet the cast. You know, they say, "Oh, this is Sean. This and that." You know, he's sitting at the table. Hello, hello, hello. You know, this and that. Um, and then they get to me. They go, oh, "It's Michael Roy Bauer. He's playing Danny Donald." And then he goes, you kept your word. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Dude, that's a banger, man. (laughs) It's insane. That is nuts. Steven Spielberg remembered me. All right. And then many years later, I'm at E3, the video game convention. And he has a company called, or I guess Lucas or Spielberg Films or Games or whatever the hell they're called. Well, no, they made a game called Medal of Honor. Oh, right, yeah. That's Spielberg's company or DreamWorks or whatever it is. Yeah, and yeah. they were having a presentation at E3. I got, you know, able to go there like as a celebrity person or whatever. But they had this big 360 pre- presentation for the trailer of Medal of Honor Airborne. So we went into this room and they got like a 360 sh- big screen and they're going to give like the first video game 360 trailer to Medal of Honor Airborne. So I'm standing there, you know, Lights go down, crowds cheering, people are climbing in, the trailer comes on, you know, Medal of Honor, Airborne, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, because I was a fan. I played Medal of Honor when I was working on Dark Angel, one of the early PS1 versions. So I'm a big fan. Like I said, I'm a fanboy. Then all of a sudden, the trailer, you know, booms, explosions. Then the game comes up, Medal of Honor, Airborne. Then, they, you know, the people at E3 are cheering. I feel, yeah. people, I feel people all around me. Then I hear, so what do you think? I'm like, fucking awesome. And then I look, Spielberg is standing next to me. You fucking can't make it up, man. This is after evolution. Spielberg is there with his son, Max. And they're stand. I guess they walked in during that premiere. You get it like to, to fill the crowd. And he might have saw me with the lights or whatever. And I don't know, but him and his security guards or whoever, all around me. And he goes, so what do you think? I'm like, fucking awesome. And I look at Spielberg. I go, oh, my God. He goes, how you been? I, oh, I, I, man. I go, I'm great. I go, I, I go, thank you, you know, for everything in my career and my life. I go, thank you. He goes, you deserve it. And this is my son, Max. And then I guess his son is like in the entertainment. And he goes, I'm a big fan, man. I'm a big fan. I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Dude, that is bizarre. I was like, yeah. Do you know Spielberg? Yeah, we're tight. We're tight. We're tight. <laughs> but uh, so we're on evolution. We're doing the read through. Uh, me- Met Spielberg, crazy. You kept your word. He's like, you kept your word. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Never going to forget that. Yeah, we did the read through. So we went to set, start filming Evolution in Arizona. It was Page, it was Arizona, Utah, California. What a great experience. Uh, Ethan is in that movie. And I remember I lost Remember the Titans to Ethan, but we're now yeah. reunited. And, you know, we're all good and everything. Ethan, you know, he was still like four or 500 pounds at that time. 
And I don't know if he wants to talk about it because he looks really good now with weight, but um, yeah. I can't be completely truthful, but he had some sort of a heart issue. Might have been a heart attack, might have been a stroke during the filming of Evolution. Oh, geez. You know, because there was one day we were being dri- driven home. We had not a limo, but like a car service that would take sure. us from the set. And um, he lived kind of in my area, about 10, 15 minutes away in Sunland. That was the area called Sunland. So we would take the, the, the car service, you know, from the set because we're kind of in the same area. And again, one day, like, he just looked livid and sweating and passed out. And, you know, when he got home, I just heard rumors the next day that, you know, he went to the hospital, some other stuff like that. So he might have literally had a stroke or a heart attack or something, you know, while we were filming because of his weight. He was a smoker and all that other stuff, man. That's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, but he's doing great now. I mean, I mean, you got to give it up to him. Like, yeah, he was just on uh, what? He was just on a Santa Clarita diet, right? I, yeah, I don't know. He's working oh, out. He was. You're right. Yeah. He's doing interviews now, you know, at a gym with my boy Patrick Renna, you know, from Sandlot. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like he works at a gym. He's got his life together. He eats the right food. He's like a muscle man now. Like, what an inspirational man. Wow. That's awesome. He, see- he seemed like a cool dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's really, really cool. But man, during that movie, I, I wanted to get as much press as I could because it was a it was like a hundred million dollar movie, man. And it's Ivan Reitman, you know, <laughs> it's brand new studio opening up. Correct. I was kind of trying to take that leap, you know, to like fame or or my next gigs, you know, because I had Dude Where's My Car, I had X Files, I had Dark Angel, I had you know, uh, you know, Evolution coming out, you know, I had a bunch of big auditions for mm-hmm. for movies that I just missed. So I was hoping to take that next level. So they had a press day. They call it like a press day where they bring on, you know, entertainment tonight and all that. And they they wanted I was the they call it the the sixth lead of the film. And it, that that means you're top billed. If you're the first six people in a movie in terms of billing, that that makes you the star of that movie. It's called top billing. So I was like the sixth lead, which made me top billing. So the press department at um, DreamWorks and all that were like, we're going to have press come in. We're going to do behind the scenes features where you and Ethan do interviews and, you know, talk about your career, talk about this movie, making it, talk about David, Juliana and all that. And Juliana had the Golden Globe people coming on set all the time. I don't know if she was buying the Golden Globes, but boy, she was giving them gift baskets and everything because I think she was up for boogie nights around that time. And for the Golden Globe. And then, um, so they're like, oh, we're going to do all this press with you and all that. I'm like, yes, 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 hell yes. And then when the day, the day came, they're like, oh, you know, the press people, I'm like, are we going to do interviews or what's going on? They're like, no, Ethan doesn't want to do any interviews. He doesn't, he doesn't want to, like, you know, be a part of that. Oh, no. And they're like, we can only sell you guys as brothers. We can't sell you as a single tandem. Oh. He, goes, he, he goes, so we scrapped it. He's like, you know, Ethan's not interested in, in doing that stuff. Because some actors, you know, they they typically, they just don't care. They don't want to. You know what I mean? In, unless, sure. they ha- unless they have to. Like, they're being yeah. paid or whatever. Yeah. But me, I'm like, dude, I want a career. You know, I want to star in movies it, like Jack Black or something. Yeah, you're hungry. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I get that. So, I, But they took it away, and I was so pissed off. So then I, I started calling press firms. Because they told me, oh, you could hire your own press person. Then they're like, oh, we want $5,000 a month plus a retainer of two months. And I'm like, my God. I go, no, I don't have money like that. Yeah, I couldn't get a press person. Again, this kind of goes back to the story of the actor from The Matrix. He wanted press. The the Latin actor that played um, the guy that put the, the programs to teach Neo. Oh, right. Yeah. Tank. Yeah, Tank. He was um, six build. Like in the movie of The Matrix, he was like sixth or seventh build. Then when they did the press, like in Vegas, where they did all the press kits, he wasn't invited. But he was literally billed at the top, you know, top six or seven. So that makes you like one of the top stars of that movie. He wanted press being a Latin actor and all that. Like he wanted everybody to know that he's in The Matrix. So apparently he showed up to the actual press kit you know, unannounced, uninvited, and made a little bit of a scene. So then that's why they didn't hire him for the other movies. So it was taken away from him as well. 
but that's kind of what happened to me. But, you know, I didn't make a scene. and I just went about my business and it came, it came back to bite me in my ass a little bit later because I, I did end up hiring a press person, but one I could afford. I found somebody that would do it for like a thousand bucks. And then, you know, they wanted like 1200 a month. They wanted a thousand dollar retainer and then 1200 a month for a uh, five months guaranteed. I was like, all right, I could spend eight, ten thousand dollars on press because dude, where's my car was about to come out. And, yeah. And, mm. you know, I was like, you know, let's do it. So I signed on with them. Um, You had a very, very small part in one of my favorite Tim and Eric uh, episodes in the uh what the hell was the name of it? The Hole, I think it was. It was the first Bedtime Stories episode. You're just in this scene where Tim and Eric are basically in this guy, in, in Tim's basement with all these snacks, and you're watching a, a quote-unquote football game, and I think it's just the TV has nothing on it. What the hell was that experience like? Yeah, Tim and Eric, uh, which one's the fatter one? Is that Eric? Yeah, with the glasses. Yeah, yeah, boy, man, fuck. They, they put me through the ringer on that damn project. Really? God. Uh, okay, so I have a friend, a very good friend of mine. He's an actor named Bo Barrett. His father is Kiki or KK Barrett. He's a big production designer. He's, he's, he works with Spike Jones, um, and he production designed the movie Her, the recent uh, Birds of Prey. And oh, nice. All the MTV music videos with Spike Jones, like Cherub Rock. For the pumpkins and, and all of that. Uh, oh, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm really good friends with, you know, like I said, his son. So um, they have these exquisite Halloween parties with famous people. I mean, you know, Drew Barrymore drained Spike Jones, and I saw them at a Halloween party, and Jack Black, I saw there. Whatever. Long story short, one day, Tim and Eric uh, are the guy, Eric, not Tim. Eric was at the party with Aziz Nanzari. Can't stand Aziz Nanzari. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, because they're buddies. I forgot about that. Oh, my God. Aziz is there, and they're sitting there at a table. Dude, I'm right there with you. Uh, I can't stand that guy. I'm sitting there, right? So then I noticed, and I noticed the guy, and I'm like, damn, the dude from Facebook is here, uh, the Garfield. I'm like, damn. I start telling my friend Bo and everything. I'm like, that's Andrew Garfield. And they're like, yeah, he's the next Spider-Man. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. He's from the Facebook <laughs> movie. So I walk up to Andrew Garfield, and I'm like, hey, man, uh, I just wanted to say I'm a big fan of your acting. And he's like, Oh man. He's like, Oh yeah. Weren't you on a, a show? Like, you know, I think I watched you growing up. I'm like, yeah. You know, donkey lips. Cause I was dressed like, I think I was chunk that year, but whatever. I was dressed as chunk from the sure. at, at that Halloween yeah, party. Yeah. So oh, I, yeah. met, I met Andrew Garfield. First off, I'm like, Oh my God, that's amazing. But again, <laughs> at these Halloween parties, you got to walk around and I don't really know everybody per se, except my friend Bo and a couple other people. So I walk around wearing the Chunk costume. And, of course, I get looks because I look like Chunk, <laughs> you know, right from the Goonies. <laughs> and then uh, so I walk over to this. They have this little breakfast nook table. Aziz Ninzari and Eric uh, is sitting at the table. And I started watching on Comedy Central late at night, Adult Swim. And they had, like, an episode where they had, like, a DVD machine of Tim and Eric like it was like a DVD maker machine yep. or something like that. <laughs> I'm a big Tim and Eric head, so you're speaking my language. I, I, just, I hated the fucking show. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> One of my all-time favorites, but okay. Uh, it's just stupid to it's me. It's weird. It's fucking very weird, I'll admit. It's not my humor. My humor is more like sure. 1970s, 80s, Animal House. You know, sure. that type yeah, of humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John C. Riley does it for me as Steve Brule. No, I'm I'm kind of with you. I'm not the I'm not the biggest fan of Tim and Eric. I understand he has an audience, but so not for me. <laughs> sure. No, I get it. Yeah, I remember watching these episodes, and I don't know if it had blood in that DVD box, but there was an episode with a lot of blood. And oh yeah, it was like I was like, what the hell is this? That that, that might have been the uh, the Terry Green machine with Zach Galifianakis, where uh, Eric cuts his fucking hands off for something, and he's bleeding all over a kitchen. <laughs> I'm just like, what the hell am I watching? This is not funny. I'm actually scared shitless. <laughs> so, but but I'm a fan of, you know, like people having their own show and respect whatever they consider talent. So I see, I didn't, I knew of Aziz Nanzari a little bit. I had auditions for Community around that time. But I, uh, I, I saw the guy, Eric, and I'm like, you know what? I go, um, I'm just going to, you know, thank him for the show and, and tell them, um, you know, that I'm I'm a fan of their creation. 
and I'm proud, you know, they, they got to show, you know, a lot of fans, whatever. So, yeah, I, I want to be recognized as well, let's be honest. So, yeah, yeah. you know, because I already had Andrew Garfield recognizing me. You're, you were riding high. Yeah, I walk up to him and I go, um, you're one of the creators of that, that, that show on Adult Swim, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. He goes, and you're Donkey Lips. I'm like, okay, yeah. I go, yeah, yeah, well, I'm an actor as well. <laughs> and then, then, then Aziz Nanzari goes, Donkey Lips? Don, what the heck is a Donkey Lips? <laughs> in his, God damn it. <laughs> in, in his thing, and I go, oh, it's a Nickelodeon show. You know, whatever on you know uh, called Camp on a Wanna Salute Your Shorts, and as he's just like, ah, 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 who watches Nickelodeon? Like doing his <laughs> stupid, <laughs> stupid comedy. The, the thing, the thing is, I can hear that shit in his voice, and I'm annoyed for you. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> you want to talk about aggressively not funny? It's the season Azari. Yeah, and then he starts telling Eric, "You recognize this kid?" You recognize this kid? Oh, he's got a funny fucking voice. <laughs> oh man. So now they're making fun of me. So I'm just like, all right, whatever, you know? Right. So I go, well, thank you for being a fan of the show. I go, I go, you know, but I, I caught your show late at night, this and that. And then Aziz goes, did you like it? Did you like it? And then Eric goes to me, yeah, what did you think? And I go, honestly, it ain't for me. I go, I didn't laugh. Then Aziz Nazari goes into that statement. What do you mean you didn't laugh? Oh, that's disrespectful. You know, you come over here talking about his talent and now you're disrespecting him that you didn't like his stuff. You know, he told you he liked your stuff. No, he didn't. He just said, you know, he I was donkey lips. He didn't say he liked it. Yeah, he identified you as a character. Yeah. yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> he just made a statement. Then he stands up and he brushes by me. He goes, I got to go talk to somebody with talent. Oh, Eric Wareheim said that? He says that to me. Goes, I got to go talk oh to somebody with, with talent. And then wow. he, goes, he goes, and um, respect. Oh, no, Aziz goes, and respect. So they both get up and just walk away. I'm like, all right. Oh my what God. Up? So now, I kid you not, a week or two or three weeks later, I get an audition for a Tim and Eric bedtime story. <laughs> all right. Whatever. You know, it's a job. It's an opportunity. They told me it was a producer session. I, and I, I told myself, I, I looked him up. I'm like, is he one of the producers? He is. But I had a lot of dialogue. I'm supposed to be watching a football game. And I'm like, yeah, come on cheering it on and I'm like yeah make me a pizza you know like stupid stupid comments or whatever while I'm watching a game then it says I sure. sit in the chair and I spill pizza all over myself and then I eat it off of myself you know like an idiot fanboy or whatever and around around that time I had my Raiders YouTube channel where I'm an idiot fanboy so maybe he watched that too or looked me up I don't know so right. I, get the, I get the audition it's a producer session I'm like great I'm probably you know gonna see, you know, Eric or, or whatever in there. So I go in there and then I start asking the people that are around. I go, is Eric going to be in the session? They're like, oh, no, he's on set. He's on set. I'm like, oh, they're like, why? I go, oh, I just wanted to apologize. I go, I met him earlier and I, I put my foot in my mouth. And then they're like, no, no, he's on set. He's on set. I'm like, all right, cool. So I go into the audition. I film the scene. Then, um, you know, I get the part. So then we, we go to set. And I'm, I'm labeled for two days' work. I get the script about their burying, burying and we're going to watch the burial yep. or, you know, whatever. So I, I get on set. Then they greet me politely on day one. I had to drive out somewhere in the middle of the night to, the, to do the outside of the, the burial scenes. I thought I was going to be in those burial scenes. This is before we filmed this stuff inside. And I... I, I, I had a bunch of lines in the script. Yeah, I don't think you have any in the actual episode, now that I'm thinking back. Maybe one? Yeah, none. Um, oh. so, but I had a bunch of lines for, to film the next day, you know, like huh. in, in the house. But this is the exterior house where we're going to do, like, the burial, where us football fat fatties, as they called it in the script or whatever, you know, we stand there and watch the burial or whatever, you know. Right, while Tim buries Eric and they all wave at him or whatever. Correct. Yeah, so, you know, I'm in that scene. I'm supposed to stand there and watch it. and So, that, you know, right. I, I had to drive down to this location like an hour and a half away, you know, to be there all night. So then they start filming it, this and that, but I they greeted me. Then the producers, some of the other producers of Adult Swim were like, oh, we're big fans here. Sit with us, sit with us at the, the monitor station or producer section. And then they were asking me questions about Flutie Shorts and this and that. And then I... I constantly apologize to Eric 
I said, dude, like, it's just not my humor. It does, I go, it doesn't mean it's not good. I, I'm like, humor or comedy is subjective. Sure. I go, it freaked me out, bro. Like, I, I don't understand it. And he's like, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. He goes, but you're going to be a part of it. Do you have a problem with being a part of it? I go, no, nah, man, y'all are paying me, man. I go, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I go, and I go, honestly, I go, this will be a nice little thing, you know, like as a cameo for fans of yours or mine. And it's going to be fantastic. He's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. And then they start filming. And then, then all of a sudden they say, let's bring in the cast for the, um, the burial scene. So the other, you know, fat football fans or whatever, they they all say, they go, okay, we're going to do a rehearsal. We're going to do a rehearsal. So they bring us all out where they set up the cameras for the goodbye, the burial, and we rehearse it and all that. Then all of a sudden, like, um, Eric is there. He's dire- I think he directed the episode. And Eric's like, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mike, move to your left. I'm like, all right. He goes, no, no, no move to your right. This goes on for about 15 minutes. Mike, stand over there. Mike, do stand over here. Mike, stand over there. They're filming this whole shit. What oh. the fuck? You're blowing my mind. <laughs> so, so like, I'm just like, all right. And then all of a sudden, he goes, no, Mike, you know, just, just step off, step off. So then I step off, and then they go, okay, let's just shoot it, let's shoot it. It probably wasn't 15 minutes. It probably sure as hell felt like it. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't know what was going on. But I'm yeah. pretty sure they were filming because the camera that was in the, like, the they d- dug a hole. The camera kept, like, moving on me. I don't know, like, if they were filming or not. So they said, oh, Mike, step to the side, step to the side. Then the minute I get to the side of the house or where the background or the backyard, there's, like, a little awning or something. Then they stand there and they go, okay, perfect. I hear, okay, perfect. Why is it perfect? Because I'm not in the shot. E, that's fucked up, dude. Like, just to fucking, like, embarrass you on set? Again. Again. Uh, this goes back to that meeting with Aziz and Zari. Yeah. They, that's their type of humor. It's called, like, emotional, situational, whatever. Well, yeah, it's like anti-humor. It's like a prank. Yeah. It's like a prank to them. Sure, yeah. So, um, so I'm standing to the side. They start filming the scene, and I'm not there. Then they film it. Then I start asking. I'm My heart is racing. Like, did I just get fired? Are they pissed at me? What is he doing? And then one of the assistant director told me, comes down, and he goes, Michael, just sit right there. Somebody will come and talk to you. Sit right there. Like, points to me like a dog and says, sit right there. Oh. And they had a little chair. And now I'm sitting there, and I'm like, while they're filming, and I'm just like, I, I, I go, I think I've been fired before. And I'm like, I think I just got fired. So my heart is racing, and I'm like, I'm just going to go home. I'm feeling, like, used and abused right now. They're like, no, somebody's going to come and talk to you. So about 10, 10, 15 minutes later, after they film a few things, uh, the producer comes up to me, uh, Michael, we're going to be sending you home. Wait, so and that was it? Well, so that's what the producer tells me. He goes, Michael, yeah. we're going to be sending you home. You're no longer needed. That's exactly how they said it. And then I'm telling this producer, and I'm like, let me talk to Eric. I go, am I being fired? What's going on? They're like, no, but, you know. We, we, we can't have you here anymore. We're going to have to pay overtime. or we're gonna, You know, you have to get off set. I'm like, I go, am I being fired? I start yelling at the producer guy. I'm like, am I being fired? What the hell is going on? He goes, I don't know. Just, you know, go sign out. You know, I'll be in contact. I'll call you later. And I, I start what yelling. And I start yelling, Eric, am I being fired? What did I do wrong? You know, then they, nobody came up to me. Nobody came up Weird. to me. So now I'm driving home. I got about an hour and a half drive home. It's like maybe 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, like 10, 30, 11. And, and then on the call sheet, I was supposed to go into another house in the San Fernando Valley for day two. Right. So I don't know if I'm fired. And it said I had to be on set the next day at like, you know, 9 a.m. at the house. So I'm like, do I show up? What do I do? I feel really disrespected right now. So I, I'm trying sure. to call my agent manager. Can't get a hold of her. Uh, I didn't want to bother her at home, but I left a message. I'm like, I don't know if I was fired or what, what I should do. So I just go home. And then I waited for a call from the producer. I called the producer, left a voicemail. I said, am I being fired? Do I show up for day two at nine o'clock? Luckily, it was in my neighborhood. It was literally like eight minutes away from where I lived. Um, the house that they filmed it at in the valley. So I go, I'm just going to show up. Yeah, I mean, what's the worst they can do is tell you to go home? Yeah, they're going to tell them to, you to go home, no? Well, and, and, you know, I could see the scene in my head that you that you went and shot. 
<laughs> you sit right next to Eric in that scene on the couch. Look at my attitude. My my face is all down. Holy and... shit, that, that puts such a new light on that. Yeah, so so I go to the set, right? Then I see the other, you know, the other actors that played the football fans. And they're, they're like, oh, man, like, what happened last night? Because they saw me yelling. And, and I'm like, I don't know. They're like, did you get fired? I go, this is what happened. They're like, dude, I don't know, man. They go, we know who you are, like, whatever. So then all of a sudden, you know, I walk into, they have a PA, like an assistant. And I go, mm-hmm. hey, um, I'm Michael Ray Bauer. I didn't know if I was supposed to come again today. I was released last night. They're like, oh, yeah, no, we know, we know. They go, okay. And then they, she gets on the walkie-talkie. Uh, Michael Bauer's here, you know. And then all of a sudden, oh, a producer uh, wants to come and talk to you. All right, they're going to send me home, right? So I'm waiting outside. Then the producer comes and goes, okay, okay, glad you can make it, Mike. Uh, we're getting to the scenes. Tim and Eric are about to rehearse. They're coming out of makeup what the fuck? in a little bit. He's like, you can hang out here. You can eat some breakfast. You can do this. The, the same producer that wouldn't tell me if I was fired or not. Wow. Is is this part of, like, how they fuck with you to put you in, like, this weird character? I have no clue. You know what I'm saying? That's it, weird because, like, again, like, the, the scene is they go in Tim's basement they eat snacks, and then Eric sits there awkwardly looking at a blank screen while Tim fucking says some bullshit to him because he's crazy in the in the in the episode. I, I don't know how comp that that's I'm I'm at a loss for words here, Michael. That's fucking bizarre, dude. Again, they this is them. You know, they probably had no ill will, but this is how they do things. Like sure, yeah, it's like a sure. joke to them, and that's why I don't understand the humor. It may be humorous for them or him to get a little bit of payback. Because I said I didn't think it was funny, so maybe they thought a prank on me would be funny, or this or that. Like, maybe they really did realize I didn't look good, you know, like, maybe because I stand out in the 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 graveyard scene, because I do stand out. I am a face, I am a character. Maybe I stand out more, and I'll take the attention away from either, you know, one of the a- actors or something. Like, who knows, you know? Like, once it comes yeah. on screen, but but then they decided to, like, let me go that way, go home. And again, I, I, I don't understand it, but I had a script with a bunch of lines and they're like, OK, we're going to be filming in a little bit. We're going to bring in for rehearsals. So they bring me in. Then I talk to Eric and I'm like, and Eric's like, man, you, you OK? You you were, you were, you were a little worried you're going off last night. I go, Eric, I don't know if I was fired, bro. I go, some guy sits me down. You take me off the stage. Uh, you sit me down. They tell me to wait there. Then the producer tells me to go home. I go, I don't know if I'm fired. I don't know what the hell's going on. And I go, nobody called me and told me to come in today. I go, I was going to stay home. I go, but you know what? You guys are paying me. I'm going to hold you to that. And I don't. I go, I don't know what trick or prank you guys are playing on me. And I go, but boy, you, you're really hurting my heart. I go, because nobody wants to be fired or made fun of like that. And he goes, oh, we're not doing any of that. Oh, no, no. We, we didn't have you in the graveyard scene. He goes, it, it just it was a lighting issue. And like he didn't tell me that I overshadowed anybody. He didn't say that. But like he was like, sure. oh, no, it was a lighting issue. So we just sent you home, you know, because we didn't want to keep you there late. You know, you had an hour and a half drive. I'm like, whatever. But you think if that was the case, they could have just said that to you instead of like, you know, giving you the runaround. Yeah. Instead of like handing you off to X, Y and Z and then like them not even have the decency to be like, yeah, Mike, X, Y and Z, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is the deal and we'll see you tomorrow or whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, like, so then he's like, no, I'm sorry. This and that. He's like, Oh, I love you. He's like, I'm a big fan of yours, man. When we met at, he said, at, when we met at KK's party and all that, he goes, we were just, he goes, I was really fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Aziz and Zari, he goes, man, trust me, we're big fans of yours, man. You know, we were really, really happy to, to you know, meet you. He's like, that's why I brought you in. And he goes, but I wanted you to earn your spot. That's why I made you audition. And I'm like, all right, you know, I can respect that. It's all good. Sure. You know, and then, so then we start to do the scene. And then now, oh, the director wasn't Eric. It was Tim. Tim was directing that episode. Forgive me. And then, mm-hmm. um, so Tim comes on the set. And then, you know, we're about to do our stuff. And so we start eating. And then we're about to do our lines and everything. We're doing a rehearsal. And Tim's like a pro. He gets in there. Let's do this. Do this. Do this. Do what I like. He doesn't really talk to me. but just gets the job done. And then. Sure. So he walks in there, and then he's this and that, and then we start to do a rehearsal, and he goes, no, you got no lines. That's what, you just like that. No, you got no lines. What the fuck? Weird. Really? A poor experience. Yeah. And then he goes, you got no lines. And I'm like, 
He goes, no, no, we're cutting that. We're cutting that. You got no lines. He goes, we're going to film this. We're going to do this. He goes, you guys are just going to sit here and cheer. We're going to eat food. Then we're going to take the camera. He's like, let's do this. Let's get to it. All right. And then I'm like, all right. So then later in the day, I started opening up my mouth. I go, I go, um, I told uh, Eric, I go, dude, if you respect me, I go, the day is almost over. I haven't had no featured cameos, just the scene where we're eating food. I go, I've had no like featured cameos that I auditioned for. And, you know, I got no acting ability in this project. I go, I go, dude, I got to have something. I go, I want to be a part of your show, whether, and I said it again, I go, whether you think that I liked it or not. I go, this is something different. It's like a horror genre that you guys are trying to do. So it's kind of unique. Yeah. And, and I go, dude, like, I want to camp, yo. Like, I want to act in it or something. He's like, oh, don't worry. Let me go. Let me go talk to Tim. We'll figure it out. Then they come back and then Tim comes back. All right, guys. And he tells the cameraman, all right, we're going to film this. We're going to have you talking and then I'm going to come and break it up. And that's the thing. But they gave me no lines. That is bizarre. They said, yeah, we, just want, we just want you to react to um, Eric talking like he's crazy or he's stupid or you don't care. You know, and then that's the end of the scene. So I was like, whatever. At least I got a close up. Yeah, you got paid. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fucked up experience, dude. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. You know, I, I threw that one to you because I thought it would be like a fun story. But uh, damn, I mean, it was interesting. But holy cow. That's why I feel a lot of a shame and fear because I've had a lot of these stories that are kind of negative with, with a really positive, beautiful life and career and meeting amazing people. This is sometimes why I don't work with people again. Because whatever these stories happen, they're negative to some people, or I rub people the wrong way. Because, again, there's many stories on evolution that we didn't get to. It's just, like, I don't know what I do, but the way I am as a person, I rub Mm -hmm. some people the wrong way, or I do things differently. And then they don't always remember me so fondly, or they don't want to work with me again. And then sometimes I do speak up, you know, like I do speak up because... I ain't going to let this shit happen to me. I'm not, I'm just not going to be a pawn. You know, sure, when, I, man. when I feel disrespected, most of the time I speak up. And again, yeah. when you speak up, they kick you out. Do you understand? Right. Yeah. That's how yeah. it happens in life. Unfortunately. But you can only put up with so much, you know? Uh, yeah, dude, you got your fucking pride too, you know? Well, thank you for that story. I'm sorry that that happened to you. Yeah, that's a bummer. And uh, I, I guess I got to reevaluate how I feel about Tim and Eric. Again, I... I'm sure he's a great guy. I've seen him in a bunch of like Apple commercials recently. I don't know what the hell he's doing. I think he's on a new TV series. It's either on Netflix or something. Yeah, I think Eric is, and Tim. Tim. I don't know. Tim does does like a, a fucking radio, essentially podcast with Vic Berger and uh, Doug Pound. So I, I, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> aren't they on a show called like Celebrity House? Oh, maybe. I, I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, Beef House. Beef House. Uh. Honestly, if you didn't like Tim and Eric, you might not like it. It's uh, that really, it, it's basically making fun of sitcoms, like old 90s sitcoms. It kind of plays up a lot of those tropes in, bas- in very bizarre and absurd ways, I guess is how I would put that. I mean, I, I would recommend it, but I would not uh, fault you at all for not watching it. That's all right. I don't know what I've been looking through, you know, the fire stick recently for all these shows, and I'm coming across all this stuff, and I'm like, eh, should I watch it? I don't know. Uh, um, but uh, I want to transition from uh, my question about a role you had. You were in actually you're in a number of uh, Rockstar games. You're in a couple of Grand Theft Auto games, and you're in Bully. And I kind of want to ask, like, is it is it more fun to be like that kind of a character where you're essentially like just a cartoon, and you get to be locked in a booth and just go nuts? Yeah. So, um, to be honest with you, I mean, whenever you do voiceover work, it's amazing because basically you go into an like a little room for like three or four hours. And, you know, you get the same, almost the same amount of rate as you would as an actor on being on set. Uh, so, you know, you don't, you put in a little bit of work and you can wear, you know, underwear or whatever. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, again, you would think throughout my acting career that I would have a lot more voice credits on cartoons and all that. But I have had trouble have it getting a voiceover agent throughout my entire career an agent to really? represent, to represent me yes and I, we've we've had meetings with a bunch of the big ones 
you know, and here's some advice that I got from a big one. I won't name no names, but they said, uh, they go, your voice is too recognizable. Ah, uh, okay. Words like I can see is essentially you instead of seeing a character. Correct. And then, so I asked them, I asked this lady, her name was Pam. She's a big voiceover agent. I said, can you expand on that? She said, well, Michael, in today's media, they want faces that are popular, really popular, like superstars, to do cartoon voices, to do the leads. Because everybody will recognize the voice, and then that'll lead to the face, that that will lead to the movie that they starred in while they're watching the cartoon. They want those real celebrities for those big roles. Sure, but then, like, what about, like, the Steve Blums and, like, the, you know, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn's and the Matt Mercer's of the world? Yeah, but they are quality voiceover talent that started basically that way, more so than a in front of camera oh, okay. actor. Sure, okay. You know, so they have major, major talent behind their voice as Got opposed you. to acting on front of film talent that I might mm -hmm. have. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm not a major superstar, so people might recognize my voice, but they all the time won't be able to place it with a starring role in a movie or a TV show. Okay. And so then they might be a little confused. This is how she explained it to me. She goes, then on top sure. of that, she goes, you're talented and your voice is recognizable. She goes, which is a great thing. She goes, but every time you speak and you try to do different characters, that recognizable point of your voice will be in every damn character. Right. So therefore, we cannot separate one character from the next because they're only listening to a voice. And then they're going to say for the rest of your career, oh, it's that guy, he can only do one character. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That's a shame, because like I did find there's a big supercut on YouTube of all of your dialogue from Bully as Mr. Buckingham, and you're hilarious. Like, <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> I want that clip. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to get it, because I don't know how to record. I didn't play the whole game to, to record anything. You get it? Like, I don't know how to record and play the games. Yeah, there's a, it's a nine-minute clip. It's every line you have in that game, just back to back to back to back. Oh, my God. Send it to me. I'll find it. I did <laughs> not know that. Um, But, yeah, I got that because I went to E3. I'm a fanboy. Like I said, I play Madden, and uh, I tried to play a bunch of games, and, like, I used my celebrity status to go to E3. And I went to E3, and a bunch of, like, video game producers or people, makers, they're running around, donkey lips, donkey lips, donkey lips, donkey lips, donkey lips. Oh, I love you, you know. <laughs> and then um, the people from that company for Bully, they're just like, you know, can you come in and, and read all these different characters and, and all that? I'm like, all right. So I got that job, but I didn't have an agent. And then word of mouth again came for Star Wars, a Grand Theft Auto. But I don't think I'm featured in Star Wars because I did like characters, like we read characters and lines, they have a script, but I don't think any of them made it into the game. You're credited as additional voices in various places. So I don't know how that all works. Again, I didn't play the game to find it. I don't really, but I did a bunch of things. I did a lot of scenes where I'm screaming like, yo, go, or, you know, I'm a Jedi. Or, you know, like, I don't know what the hell I say, dude. And then there was one where I was like an old what do they call it? Not muse, mage, 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 or something like in mage. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was a Jedi when I was younger. You know, I, I, like I don't remember all the lines, but there was at least fifteen or twenty different lines. And then I did a lot of screams and yells and action voices, like oh, 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 you know. So I don't know how they used it, but apparently Kirk Bailey, the actor from Saluja Shorts, did a lot of voiceover work as well, and I think he was in that Star Wars one as well. And then, um, then again, so I got another job on Grand Theft Auto, and I did the same thing. I did a bunch of voices or whatever. Um, I, I had one about a prostitute. It was hilarious. Oh, uh, not surprising. I think they, I think they put it in there for fun because they want to see Donkey Lips talk about a prostitute. Sure. Like, so I think the writers put stuff like that in there when we're when we're recording it just for fun. 
the one I found was from uh, Grand Theft Auto 4. You're like the guy in the bank when they're robbing it, and you fucking you get up and you start shooting at the bank robbers, and they just blow your character away. <laughs> Again, I don't even know if that's me. It sounds really stupid. You would think that I would know my roles. I mean, they're crediting you to it, so you might as well own it, right? I don't know, man. I... I don't know. I haven't played. Like I said, I haven't played these fucking yeah, sure, games. Sure. Apparently, they got another Nickelodeon actor in the Grand Theft Auto. Uh, what's his name? My boy, the actor from Pete and Pete. He is in GTA Four. Oh, Danny Tamborelli. There he goes. He was in Five. But didn't he play uh, the, one of the main characters' sons? Yes, it's Five. Yeah, he's he's Michael. Is it Michael? Michael's son. Sounds right. So there it is. There's the Nickelodeon connection. They had Donkey Lips earlier. Yep. But when when, <laughs> when 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 we audio record, like I said, if there's no like certain character. They, they they make you do a lot. They want to get as much out of you because they don't know what characters in the game or whatever you're going to be. Oh, right, yeah. That was in my case. You know, I can't speak for the other voiceover actors, but in my case, I just had like, you know, six or seven pages of a bunch of stuff and grunts and this and that, and I would just say the lines, and then they would be like, this time on this one, you know, you, you, you have a deeper voice, so try to be deeper, you know, or on this one, you're a loud man, you're a nerd, I'm kind of crazy. You know, like, that's what they made me <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Hey, give, sure. me my, give me my car. That was one of the lines, right? Now that I'm thinking about it, it's like, hey, wait, that's my car. And then there was, there was another one I go, shut up, ho. <laughs> Gotta look for that. Holy shit, dude. Now I have now I gotta be keeping an ear out for that. I gotta look up yeah, I gotta look that up. Yeah, but you know, I really I really wanted to get like a career in voiceover acting because I you know, I can learn, you know, I will study to try to make my voice different and better, but I, I want an agent, you know, so at least I can get the process started. Sure, man. I mean, the big agents, they haven't taken me on and it's very detrimental. So I haven't really went out and looked for you know, a smaller one recently to do commercials. Like, do you have hemorrhoids? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, I struggled with it in my teenage years. All right, dude. All right, finally, we hit we hit the uh, the point of where we're going to talk about the willies. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> three and a half hours in. <laughs> it's okay because all of that stuff was fucking gold. Oh yeah. Probably going to end up splitting this into two episodes, though. You could do a two parter, brother. You could do a two parter. Yeah. All right, dumpster dwellers. This is the part where we're going to talk about the actual film that we reviewed, the willies. If you want to stop it here and go listen to that episode first, and then come back because there is going to be spoilers. Um, we're going to get into it. All right, Mike. So, uh, the willies. What you play Gordy Gordy Belcher in this film? Um, a little boy who doesn't have friends. Uh, he's kind of a bully, you know. He um, and he collects dead flies and kind of builds this world in this basement. Now, this is one part of an anth- of an anthology film, which you know, there's there's a couple stories in the beginning, and then the the two main parts are uh, uh about a about a monster janitor, and um, and the second part is about. Uh, your character Gordy so I just want to talk a little bit about this about like um how you got the part um your feelings on the part um and just kind of some kind of experiences on the set I know there's a lot of weird production things with this film particularly that um parts of it were shot a few years before this even came out and um if you want to go into a bunch of that stuff I mean we're all ears. I'm I'm really interested to hear some some stuff about this. Yeah, this ended up turning into like a cult classic for like whether it be fans of mine or or fans of horror in the vein of creep show type movies. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of a looking back, it's a pleasure to to have been in this movie and I cannot believe how many fans to this day, you know, beyond Donkey Lips come up to me and and, and talk about the Willies. It, it's really, really insane to me to think that how it's lasted throughout the years. And that being said, I never got a dime to film this movie. I never got oh. paid one, oh. red, one red penny. But that's what independent films do. And, you know, yeah. at, the end of the, at the end of the day, uh, the director, I think his name was Brian Spicer. He's a big horror actor from, like, the Living Dead movies. Not Brian Spicer. Brian Peck. Sorry, Brian Peck. He was in a bunch of movies like Night of the Living Dead or Return of the Living Dead. Um, and he's a big horror fan. And he was working on Growing Pains and trying to come up with the money to make this movie. So, like, every year or two, I, I guess he had a little bit in his budget. So he filmed some of the scenes, like, with the actor from Growing Pains. Uh, you know, the earlier kid scenes with the monster in the bathroom. 
you know, mm-hmm. with, with whatever money he had. And then he had to raise more capital to finish the movie. And then he shot it with his best friends. You know, some of the caveats like the dog in the microwave or the poodle. And, mm-hmm. you know, he filmed it with, you know, Kimmy Robertson was her name. She's awesome. But like, uh, you know, he filmed all this stuff whenever he had money. Basically, he was doing an independent movie on his own for many, many years and in the vein of horror and creep show. And you got to respect that. So that led into, you know, me auditioning and, and all that. Cause they, they filmed some stuff before. And, um, I met Brian Peck. He was, uh, an acting coach. He's the director of the Willies, just to let you guys know. I don't want to mm-hmm. talk. There's some bad pedophilia stories out there. Oh no. Yeah. With him. Uh, you know, you guys can look that up later. But nothing happened with me, so I'm not going to worry about well, none good. of that stuff. <laughs> Is that good? I mean, I mean, good that it didn't happen to you. Boy, I avoided those pedophiles because I was fat and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Again, I'm not trying to, you know, discredit his name or anything, but it's just, sure. it's a story that, like, wow, it's just, when you grow up, you're like, wow, that's crazy, right? So he was working on Growing Pains. He was an acting coach for, like, Leonardo DiCaprio, who ended up on Growing Pains. And he was an acting coach for the other actor that was in the Willies. I forget his real name, but he was one of the you know the kids with the monsters or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he, I I forget his name, his actual name in in the film, but yeah, he's one of the three bullies in that in that first story. Yeah, that's how th- they met or whatever. And then Brian ended up working on Growing Pains with him. And then Leo, I was friends with Leonardo DiCaprio because we went to acting school together uh, for many years and. Leo invited me to the set of Growing Pains, and so I met Brian Peck then early on. And then a little while later, I guess he was doing the Willies, so that I got a call to do the audition, met Brian in the audition, read the part. Then he asked me in the room, he's like, he goes, Mike, uh, we have a, a – not mealworm. She told me uh, maggots. He's like, Mike, uh, we're going to probably have maggots. Do you have a problem with, like, putting maggots – over your pajamas or something like that if you get the ball. Yeah. And I'm like, I go, I'll do anything. I go, this is like a leading <laughs> role in a movie, man. I go, this is a leading role in a movie. I go, put maggots on me. I go, I've had worms on me. I go, you know, put anything you want on me. Now looking back with the pedophilia story, it, it doesn't sound so good. <laughs> oh, no. But I'm an actor and I'm just trying to get, you know, any job I can. Sure, yeah. So I'm like, I'll do anything. You know, I'm one of those eager, eager MFers. <laughs> so you know i get the job and then you know they tell me oh you're gonna film it in san diego uh we and we had to drive out there they gave us a hotel in san diego for the house and the property in that area and i was gonna be there in the hotel and we brought my brother and my father which is an amazing moment now that i think about it to have with my family you know filming a movie in san diego in a hotel um because i played nintendo like the kid in the wizard or like christian slater did in the wizard where they pulled out the Nintendo in the middle of the night and they played like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I was sitting there playing Marble Madness like all night. <laughs> like Marble Madness, man, in a hotel while I'm filming that movie. Yeah, so we started filming it and it was a good experience. You, you, actually, you play a pretty mean-spirited character, in my opinion. Yeah, I realized I wasn't getting paid during the middle of it. So I was like, <laughs> Well, because the way that the the movie sets your character up, at least the first the first half of your your part, I actually was pretty sympathetic towards your character, and then you you feed a little girl like a a, a cookie with fucking flies in it. So I guess I guess my question would be just to just to kind of put a button on that is you know how how did you how did you feel playing that kind of part? Um, you know what? I don't know. I was just going through the motions. Uh. It was a little disturbing, but I thought I was going to be a movie star because, like, in my mind, it was like a leading role, and that was like gotcha. one of the, that was yeah. like one of the first movies that I kind of ever had like a big part in, you know, where I'm going to be in every scene. And, mm-hmm. and I was telling my dad, "I'm going to be a movie star," you know, I'm in a, starring in a horror movie, blah blah blah. Uh, so I guess I was probably full of myself, you know. I pro- I probably thought I was King's King's Poopoo. <laughs> But yeah, you know, they just told me I was a mean kid. You know, I had a lot of anger and um, mm-hmm. that was how to go about the part. And then they're, they're like, you pull a lot of pranks and this and that. And you don't wash your hands after you play with the flies before you eat a chicken. Yeah. Before you eat a chicken. <laughs> <Yeah. dinner." laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm like, all right, all right, you know, let's do it. And there, there's one really cool shot um, that I can speak about where I'm coming home from Spivey's farm and like stealing the manure that makes the flies grow. There's one scene where I walk into the house and the camera is like outside of the house one of those dollies that go high into the air. Yeah, nice, a big, a huge crane, right? Crane, there you go, crane shot. Yeah. So then, watch it. It's amazing shot. I, I'm running up a hill. I'm a fat kid that cannot run. <laughs> I'm running up a hill. I have to enter the house. Then I have to run through the kitchen, the living room. Then I have to go up a, like a flight and a half of stairs. Then I have to get to the door while the crane is moving up to the window that's on the second story. Then I have to wait for action and continue the scene where I pull out the bottle or the the coffee bottle Mm -hmm. or coffee can of flies and manure. And then I have in the camera crane goes into the window and it films me doing that whole scene. Boy, that that was insane, man. Um, I literally twisted my knee when I had to run up the stairs because we were rehearsing it and I wasn't getting up there in time to open the door right when the camera goes up. So we had to time it all out. And I twisted my knee on one of them and they popped it back in on set. Oh, oh. Click. <laughs> and no. boy, that thing swelled up like a madman. I had it happen before because I pulled out my uh, my knee um, in other at high school and some other things like it happened before. So I kind of knew that it wasn't broken, that it just yeah. needed to be popped back in. And since it, it's happened before, my body kind of gets used to it. So it didn't swell up for that long. You know, it was better after we iced it. But, boy, gotcha. actually, it's an interesting scene to see. Yeah, well, it, it's dope. I mean, I, I love the way that it, that that shot. And uh, to learn that you hurt yourself getting that shot, I mean, it's pretty good like you know what i mean and and for doing it like all practical too you know what i mean like having to time it out and all that stuff i feel like i feel like that's that's a that's a lost kind of art nowadays too uh, with cg and just kind of being able to just cut this here and pop this over there you know this is all done like real time so i I really appreciate it i guess is what i'm saying yeah it's really really cool if you if you ever want to do a podcast with all my injuries on it on show, I'll, I'll come out with those, man. Trust me. Why don't you do it? You should do it. I'm giving you guys the exclusive of all exclusives. I have not told some of these stories, man. Uh, dude, it's it's. I f- we're honored, really. It's because you're amazing um, people, and 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 I'm enjoying myself, and I feel like thanks, you guys dude. Are, you guys are like friends, and I'm just shooting the shit with my friends, even though it will go public. I, I'm okay. <laughs> I don't think I said anything bad. I I just told you my stories and my experiences. My brother is a fly. Um, Cause my brother and my father were. Oh, really? Family. Yeah, my brother ended up being one of those flies at the end that ripped my arm yeah. off and come in the room. <laughs> so my my brother got a job. He's like, look in the credits. It'll say like fly number three, and it, it'll say Buddy Bauer. Because again, Buddy oh Rich. man, ah, those, those fucking fly suits are pretty cool looking. Yeah, the effects the effects are really well done. And the girl that I fed the flies to, she's the sister of the Home Improvement Kid. No. Jonathan Taylor Thomas? No, name the other ones. There's one of them married a teacher. Oh, there's Brad and Mark are the other two, but I don't know the name of the actors. Yeah, there's Jonathan Taylor Thomas. There's the other guy that continued his acting career. He was on Buffy. But then there's the other one that married a teacher, married his teacher. Oh, the guy who is like a big right winger now? I forget his name, but that's how I remember him. Taryn Noah? Whichever the youngest little, yeah. you know, oh, oh, little yeah. kid, that was his sister. So he was on set with the mother. And that was his sister. You know, she had an acting career as well. She was a little bit of a cutie. So believe me, I was like liking girls and trying to flirt. All those <laughs> girls wearing the cheerleading outfits. It was fantastic. I think I was like 14, 15, 16, coming into my own. <laughs> you know? There you go, dude. But my, bro- <laughs> my brother is also behind her with his weird, like, Christian Slater hair. Oh, really? <laughs> and they actually handed her a fly cookie to see if she noticed. Now, were you actually ripping, like, legitimate wings off of flies or those props? Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> yes. So, so how did they go about that, dude? Did they just, like, catch a bunch or <laughs> what? They filmed in search, right? And um, I wasn't there for the in search. They had, like, a stunt hand 
for some gotcha. of those shots, it was not me. But then when they did like, you know, the little bit further out shots, they had a fly wrangler. So literally this guy's got like a box of flies outside. I guess they're all well maintained and fed properly. I don't know. <laughs> a fly wrangler. That's <laughs> they're trained. High quality shit they're feeding on. So then they brought in flies for the wider shots and they were like, oh, you don't have to, you know, rip the wings off or anything, but just make the motion, you know, because we're not going to see it. We have inserts. Or something. And I was just like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up ghetto. I grew up playing with flies. Flies and cockroaches <laughs> became my friends, man. Every time I'd come home and turn on a light, I'd see a cockroach running up the wall. And then all of a sudden, the light comes on and he stops. Like, I can't see oh, you, yeah. cockroach. Like, I can't see you, cockroach. You're in the middle of the wall. And I got the light on. Like, I can't see you. So oh, they man. stop and they pause. You know, they're like, did you see me? Yeah, I see you, cockroach. What's up, Richie? <laughs> Richie the Roach. How you doing? Remember Richie the Roach from Different Strokes <laughs> with Danny Cooksey? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> Go way back. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up around cockroaches and flies and disgusting things. So it didn't really bother me. Well, if, if you were ripping the wings off, how did the fly wrangler feel about that? I, I don't think he cared. Uh, he probably got paid for <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I got seven million of these things. Who cares? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I just go, I just go make some more. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of takes though. To be quite honest with you, like it was like such an independent thing, and I think they were using film back mm -hmm. in those days, so they had to pay per roll or whatever it was. So like we would rehearse it like five times, of course, not rip off the wings, but then we would do it once or twice, and then that would pretty much be it, you know. Now, when you go to Spivey's farm the first time. Uh, you break through a bunch of boards and you you kind of put them back nicely and then he catches you and you like kick the shit out of these boards and break through. Was that was that in the script or was that just you in the moment? Uh, these fucking boards kept hitting me in the head <laughs> <laughs> during rehearsals. You get it? Like I guess the production designers didn't know how to make a board that swivels from the left to the right. Like I don't know what what the hell they're doing, but like these boards kept hitting me in the head. You know, every time I would try to exit. Like, it would hit me, and, or it would fall. The, like, the nail would fall, and it might hit my head or my ear, you know, because they had, like, a nail on the top of the board yeah, or yeah. whatever. And then they made the most stupidest special effect of, like, the board getting blown open. That was so stupid. They pre-cut it with a saw. <laughs> and then pulled it out. <laughs> they put a string, and then they had a guy with, like, salt on his hand behind the, the fence. So they'd pull it out with the string, and the guy would go, and he'd blow on the salt. <laughs> To make it really? like a gunshot. Yeah, that's so stupid. I told him on the middle of it, I go, this looks stupid as fuck. I kind of love it. Like like you were saying in the beginning, man, like this is like such a cozy movie for me. Um one one of my favorite cozy anthologies ever is is the Willies. And um and yeah, man. I and and and, and to call back from what I was saying before, um, you know, Dark Angel you were great in Dark Angel, and I feel like you this is one of your best performances, too, in my opinion, especially um, like since you're younger and then kind of Dark Angels, your older performance. But like you really do a great job um, kind of capturing Gordy's turmoil and stuff and like his problems with like being bullied at school. Because, I mean, you even have a line. He's like, you know, you know, people kids think I'm too mean or, or, or too fat or whatever. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I, I can't help but think, too, like. Does it did it ever like bother you when you when you play roles like this sort of like I, I don't I don't want to call it typecasting but like you know does does it bother you in general like when you, when you when you're offered roles like this uh, I mean if you really want to delve deep and and go to a negative spot you could say I'm the best actor and I should have better roles and they need to stop typecasting me but I am who I am and sure you know but throughout each and every role, like I said, if you can be typecasted, that's fine. But if you can become memorable or you could show your heart or, you know, or some people could see through that character that's a bully and see the actual heart or whatever mm -hmm. and become memorable, then, you know, it's fine. Because like I said, regardless if I was typecasted or not, which I probably would still will be the rest of my life or whatever, it's fine because like. I'm still memorable, you know, so like, yeah, don't, absolutely. Don't really bother me. I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to be Superman. You know, I don't, I don't, th 
Unless they make a fat Superman. <laughs> hey, man, there's a first time for everything. What was the name of Superman's doppelganger? The bad one, Brainiac? Bra- Bizarro. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I um. Yeah, I'm sorry if I if I brought the if I brought the room down with that. I just I I, I just want you to know wah, that wah, like wah. <laughs> you fucked everything up, Not man. Yet. You went emotional. I'm sorry, dude. Uh, dude, no, I'm, I I just want you to know that like you are a great actor. Not you, you. It's not that you were. You are. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Thank you, therapist. So, Appreciate it. So no, I'm I'm saying I'm being honest with you, man. I'm being like, Tim and Eric. I'm being a sarcastic <laughs> asshole. Thank you, therapist. Thank you, Aziz. But but yeah, it's it's just you know this film's really really close to me and 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 uh, I'm glad that you made it. Yeah, it it it's kind of it's made its way around uh, DVDs and, and all that. Like the production company uh, that bought it or whatever. Like I said, they never paid anybody. They got sued. They went bankrupt. They oh, uh, shit. other companies bought the film. They released it on DVD. Then when SAG or whatever you know tries to get money for it. They they go out of business or they sell it again. It just goes round and round. Really, there is some hidden stuff. There's like a comic book that was made. Yes, I've been tr- I've been trying to get my hands on this. It's too expensive, man. It's like they made like I think fifty or a hundred copies in general. I saw one go for twenty bucks and I missed it. <laughs> Ouch! I had yep. a version of it. I lost it. I don't know what I did. I'm an a idiot. I, I lose everything. But uh, yeah, I want another one. Uh, there is one on eBay. I saw it. I think it was like 150 bucks, and I was like, eh, should I really spend it? I got pictures of the comic book. Another friend of mine, um, Devin, Devin Whitehead, he's a big, like, movie fan. He bought a copy. Oh, yeah, man. Got a copy, and he took, like, really good pictures of my character from the comic and sent it to me. So I could just print up the shots, you know, in high def if That's I wanted so to. Cool. Yeah, man, I know Devin. Um, he's he's friends with my buddy Jeremy. Yeah, I love him all. Devin's an awesome. Yeah, Devin's really cool. But yeah, that's pretty cool. That that was like the first time I saw myself in a comic book back in the days when they gave me the comic book. I was like, man, that's cool, dude. That like that must have blew your mind. <laughs> like, dude, I grew up, you know, buying comic books. You know, I spent so much money on comic books; it's ridiculous. <laughs> and I did it in we the all. worst, the worst error ever. The early yeah, you 90s, did. the late 80s, <laughs> early 90s. You know, I'm buying up the death of Superman. I'm buying five copies, hot off the presses. You know, a company called from Todd McFarlane called Prime comes out. You know, they got a super, you know, new company. All the companies are becoming other companies. They got Malibu Comics. They got Prime Comics. <laughs> I'm like, I'm buying, I'm buying the first editions of everything. The Max. You know, Spawn. I'm buying five copies because I had Nickelodeon money. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I bought I bought so many editions of those some of those books, and you get it because it was popular at the time. But they never panned out into big bucks. Um, I did have another question about the Willies. So at the end of the the film, you are like like Joe kind of said, you get your arms ripped off by these flies, and and maybe this is an obvious answer, but to me, maybe it's not. Um. How did they do that prosthetic? Like uh, with your arms basically ripped off and you're just bleeding at the uh, elbows. Yeah, they built, uh, like they put, you know what? I can't really remember, but it was either handcuffs or rope. <laughs> oh God, now I'm in bed with the flies <laughs> ripping my hands off and I got handcuffs and a rope off and I'm like a teenage boy. I'm sorry, I'm going back to that pedophilia thought. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh! Oh, no. I'm I'm sorry, Brian. Forgive me. Forgive me, Brian. <laughs> um, uh, but no, I I think they they like they they did something where they put me like they cut into the pajamas for the bed shot. Uh, when I guess I get them ripped off and they show me like that, they they yeah. cut like the back of the pajamas. They had like a you know a bigger size one, and then they tied my hands back like with either a rope or handcuffs or. Or something like that. But then they had these like little plastic stumps or whatever that looked like a part of the arm with, mm-hmm. you know, like a bone sticking out. And then I right. think I think they had like blood on it or something. So then that was glued into the fabric while my hands are behind. But, you know, they, oh, okay. they glued it into the fabric on the side. So when you're looking at it, you can't, it looks a little bit weird in my shoulder area. But that what they did, they put like blood in a fabric and like a fake type limb or something like there. It's 
pretty intense for basically like a kid's horror movie. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> then, then it cuts into the shot where I'm on the hammock at the end of it. And then I got mm-hmm. the, those metal metal pieces or whatever. Yeah, your little prosthetics. <laughs> yeah, those were like prosthetics where, you know, I could actually like a pirate where I can kind of hold it like a pirate. Right, right, right. I can have it on the tip of my, my hands or whatever. And then, um, then the crane goes up, but you can see the person, they had sticks attached to those prosthetics. Even though my hand could fit in, I couldn't move them because mm-hmm. I, I had to be still. So they had like a guy with sticks like attached to those prosthetics as well. So like he would move the stick up and down and that would make my hand move with the pro not prosthetic, but like the, the metal thing or whatever it was. Yeah. Right. The like that little claw thing. Yeah, and if you look closely you could see the the, the guy's head behind the hammock <laughs> you know, like you know, move, moving the sticks or whatever, where I try to get a fly off of my face where he oh, picks man. up the stick and he goes like this and I'm like, and then um the, the story with the maggots gets pretty interesting. So, again, now we're coming to the famous scene, and he asked me in the audition, would I allow maggots on my body, this and that? And so we're, we're filming that scene. He's like, the whole day, they're like, oh, you know, we're going to do that scene tonight. You know, we're going to do that scene tonight. Like, they're egging it on all day. I'm like, yeah, shut up, shut up, whatever. It's all good. And then, so the fly wrangler, he handled all the animals and everything. And then he comes up to me, he goes, they're not going to be maggots. They're going to be mealworms. Bunch of mealworms. You know what a mealworm is? And I'm like, kind of. He explains it to me and this and that. And he goes, well, we want you to wear a, you know, a bunch of clothing. Because, you know, these things are small. We're going to pour them all over you for the dream sequence. Uh, and he goes, but they can get into crevices. So you need to put on, you need, you need to put on a lot of clothing because they can burrow their way in. That's what they do. Oh, no. That's what mealworms do, you know, like with, with the the dirt or whatever. Um, so I'm like, all right, cool. So I put on like a, a nice tight, tight underwear type uh, thing. Then I put on, I think, a pair of boxer shorts. Then I put on like a, a, a semi-tight pair of sweatpants. Then they put on the pajamas on top of that. Then I, I think I have like a tank top or one of those shirts or two of those shirts. And then they put on the pajamas on top. So I sit down. Then they bring in like a bucket of mealworms or whatever. You know, now they're ready to film because they want to film as soon as possible. You know, just get it done. This is what you're going to do. So I rehearse it without the mealworms two, three, four different times to do the scream and the reveal and all that other stuff. So then they finally throw the mealworms on me and they're like, let's get going. Let's get going. Then they throw the mealworms on. They're like, all right. And all of a sudden, a light burns out. Oh, no. Something happened with a light. And they're like, oh, we got to fix the light. Like, so they're calling up. And I'm just sitting there. I didn't care because I didn't really feel anything. I'm just like, whatever. You know, like, I got all this clothing on. I'm like, cool. Takes about five minutes, man. They get the light back up. You know, make sure everything's good. You know, good. Then they had to start picking mealworms off the ground and trying to throw them back on there. Like onto the bed. I'm like, all right, they're like, you ready to go? Cool. So we filmed it like two or three times. Then I get done and they're like, all right, Mike, we're, we don't want you to kill any of the mealworms while you get up. So we got to try to get you up as easy as possible. Oh my God. That is a big thing in Hollywood. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, you got to try to respect life. Sure. Yeah. So they're like, let's try to brush off all the mealworms. So they start coming and, and taking some up and then they kind of get it to where okay, you can stand up now and whatever. So then I stand up. They have like a a mattress, not a mattress, like a blanket. And then I start trying to shake them off of my shirt or the pajama bottoms or whatever. Then they're like, okay, go to the bathroom. And then two people follow me. They're like, you need to take off your clothes slowly in the bathroom. And, you know, there's going to be some mealworms in there somewhere, you know. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I go in the bathroom. So I start taking, you know, certain pants off. And I'm like, oh, my God, there are, like, a, a decent amount of mealworms, like, in between the sweatpants or whatever, in between my from, boxers. Oh, man, from, like, burrowing through the through the clothes? Yeah, somehow getting in there through nooks and crannies, you know, like, whatever. Yeah. So I'm going deeper. And now, of course, I'm finding less and less. But now I get to my, literally, my last, like, shirt and my last pair of drawers, which is the, like, tidy whities that I had on. And I'm like, you know, okay. I, I had another, there was a, a, a guy in there with me, you know, like knocking them off when I was taking them down. 
Then I get to the last one and he's like, oh, you know, do you want me to leave the room to take that one completely off to make sure that there's nothing, you know, in your genitalia area? And of course I said, yes, you know, I was very embarrassed. And I'm like, sure. yeah. So, you know, he gets out of the room and then um, I take off the last pair of underwear, the tidy whities and I kid you not, in my penis hair, there was about two of them, oh. two or three of them in there. Oh, oh dude. I, I, have, I have no clue how they got there. My God. That's absolutely. fucking terrifying. <laughs> that was very, very scary. And I just started going, oh, my God, they're like in my genitalia of my penis. Like, and, then, and then one of the guys, what do you mean they're in your penis? I said, no, oh, I'm no. Not, like in my hair. He goes, they're not in your penis. <laughs> it, it, but it was, it, that was interesting, man. Holy shit, dude. Yeah. I, <laughs> did, it, uh, did it ever uh, make you want to repeat that uh, kind of scenario? Have a bunch of fucking mealworms poured on you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every year on the anniversary of filming it. <laughs> You know, I, I want to get together with some millworms. And, but a lot of people that ask me, were they maggots? Were they maggots? So I just go along with the story and say, yeah, they were. <laughs> you, you, well, you can clearly tell that they're mealworms, but, you know. Not everybody knows what they look like, Joe. No, I know. But I joked with the crew, you know, and the director, Brian, around that time. I was like, I go, you know, I found some in there. I go, I need hazard pay. I go. That's an additional. <laughs> that's an additional seven hundred dollars per mealworm. And he's like, "Yeah, I was on deferred payment to make that movie. That means oh, when man. they make money, they pay you later. So I never end oh. up getting any money. But whatever, it's all. Good. Yeah, that's a bummer, dude. Yeah, I met Brian many years later at conventions. Uh, I met him a lot, you know, throughout the years in the alleyway to beat him up <laughs> for, your, for your cut. <laughs> dude, he ended up again. I don't know why I'm saying this, but he ended up being like the boyfriend to Brett Ratner. What? Yeah, he's in the X-Men movies. Is that the director of X-Men? Brett Na Oh, right. Brian, Brian Singer. Brett Ratner only directed one of them. Yeah, Brian Singer or whichever one directed X-Men. Yeah, it was Singer. Well, Brett Ratner directed X-Men 3, but Singer's directed pretty much everything except for 3 and First Class. Well, just look up Brian Peck is his name. P-E-C-K. He's the director of The Willies. He has a long tenured history. He worked with Charlie Sheen as an acting coach and all that. But uh, again, there's rumors around, you know, about those parties, you know, that either Brett Ratner or Brian Singer. And he's in, in almost every movie as a cameo. That guy, Brian Peck, the director of The Willies, he, he's in a cameo of every movie that either Brett Ratner or Brian Singer made. Like he's at a phone booth in one of the X-Men. He's like a news reporter in X-Men 2. Yeah, I, I just Google his name, and it's uh, every single link is about him doing some nasty shit, so... Yeah. Damn. Sorry about, sorry about that. Corey Feldman's on here. Oh, no. I guess we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to go out on a downer here. It's a shame. No, because it has been so good. <laughs> Let's not do that. Yeah. yeah. That's what I meant, like, but again, that's in the, the Hollywood airwaves right now is a lot sure, of that talk. Sure. And like I said, I recently found out about, you know, the director I worked with and some other people that I worked with, you know, being accused or whatever. So technically it's on the tip of my tongue. Not that I want to talk about it, but it's just, sure. right, right. You know, I've known Corey for years. I just recently saw Corey Feldman at a convention. Um, and he asked me to be a part of his like crusade. Cause me and mm -hmm. Dan me and Danny cook, used to go to Corey's that, that club that Corey yep. used to go to. It was called Alfie's soda pop club. Yeah. And again, I was kind of a part wow. of that. And, and then so when I saw Corey Feldman, he's like, oh, how's Danny? How you doing? Oh, Mike, I got this movie coming out. I'm making a documentary. He's like, you want to be a part of my crusade against all these people? And I'm like, nothing happened to me, Corey. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you, bro. Like, if something happened to you guys, I'm truly sorry. But thank goodness, nothing happened to me. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. Jeez, yeah. And now I'm in a documentary about child actors with Corey. It's, it's, it's all coming back. It's all weird and interesting. What's that documentary called? Stigma. 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 Is that is that out now or is that coming out soon? You can look up the trailer. I think the trailer's online. They're still filming filming it. Like a friend of gotcha. mine, Chris Canote, and one of the kids, Aaron. No, not Aaron. Um, from uh, Mighty Ducks. Uh, he played Harp on Heavyweights or Mighty Ducks or whatever. He was the lead in one of the leads in Heavyweights. With Sean mm -hmm. and all that. He's making the mm -hmm. documentary about, you know, the stigma attached to child actors. And, mm -hmm. and 
he wants to prove that not all of them are crazy or they all get into drugs or they've all been molested. Like he's trying to, he's trying to say that the word child actor, and he's trying to show the stigma attached to that word is a bad one. That, that's, that's really interesting to me. It should just be actor. So look it up. It's called stigma. It's pretty interesting. Okay. Yeah. I definitely want to check that out. Um, speaking of plug and stuff, uh, Mike, you got a YouTube channel. You got a. Do you? You have a podcast. You have a bunch of stuff. Um, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find your stuff? Uh, where they can subscribe to you? Where they can buy stuff? Uh, you you mentioned a cameo you had before. Just Google Donkey Lips. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I don't really got a website going right now where you can find everything in one location. Uh, you know, I keep up to date with YouTube videos. I have a career channel. Just search Michael Ray Bauer. You'll find links. Um, and again, you know, I sell some T-shirts, designs I have, and I have a cameo. If you'd like to support me, you know, during this COVID crisis, I'd appreciate paying my rent. Um, there's no work out there. Uh, but again, yeah, you could just Google me, man. I love you all and thank you. Awesome, dude. And thank you so much, dude. I, I can't believe we talked. You, you talked with us for this long and you gave us so much amazing uh, insights and stories uh, to your career and your life. And we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. No worries. And again, look, at, look throughout that movie, The Willies, and look at all the growing pain cameos. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot in there. I mean, there's that scene you were talking about earlier with Kirk Cameron where he's like on the TV and he's like, he, he talks to you directly. Yeah. Or Gordy Belcher. Yeah. <laughs> he was becoming religious with his wife at the time. Right. He was becoming very religious at yeah, the time. Yeah, I was actually, after I watched the movie, I, I looked him up and I was like, am I a fucking moron? I was like, he his sister is DJ Tanner. I was like, how did I never put that together? I didn't realize it either until you told me. <laughs> <laughs> Candace Cameron. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I always had a crush on her growing up, and then, but the the girl Believe in it. the the girl in the Willies with him beca- became his wife. That 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 that's wild. That's yeah, she insane. was on, she yeah. was on Growing Pains as well. That's where they met and all that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I did read that. Yeah. She's also on a episode of um, Tales from the Dark Side. Um, Mookie and Pookie. Remember Tales from the Dark Side, dude? One of my favorite shows. Wasn't that the the, the intro where it had a bunch of trees in black and white? And they're like, oh, yeah, from the dark side. And it kept showing like a forest of trees in black and white. Yep. Man lives in a sunlit world of what he believes to be reality. That's what it was. That shit scared the shit out of me. Dude, it's still good. (laughs) So what are you what are some of your favorite horror movies? Okay. So long story short, to this day, at my adult age, um, I don't like horror movies. I, I, I think they're all stupid. They don't scare me. But there are the exceptions. Again, growing up as a kid, they definitely affected me. Because, you know, my brain didn't know reality from fake or whatever. So I was kind of like, this is really intense. But as I grew older, you know, horror movies didn't do it for me. You know, like, they just were not scary. The real horror movie is Donald Trump as the president. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and politics. But uh, Sure. But there are the occasional exceptions. So growing up. I was definitely a fan. Again, like we talked about that mausoleum movie, whatever the name of it is, it really scared me. The Phantasm movies, that scared the heck out of me with that little, oh, yeah. that ball that would run around. And I think there are oh, little yeah. midgets in that movie. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then they had troll, they had midgets with like screwdrivers on their head. Scared the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, uh, dude, my friend Leo was in one of those movies, like Trolls or something like that, or... Critters, th- Critters 3. That's what it was. I remember that. But yeah, I definitely grew up on those movies, and Poltergeist was the one that did me in. Dude, that's one of my favorite movies. It's a great film, dude. Poltergeist is still scary. Yeah? Oh, yeah. We couldn't afford cable growing up, and I'm like, you know, eight years old, and I'm allowed to watch TV or rent a movie or whatever, and at night, literally like around 11 or 12, a lot of channels would turn their TV to that static... Sim- like that signal, like after 12 o'clock, they would stop broadcasting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sign off, dude. Yeah, that image to me of the gray was like really like prominent in my life. And so then I, I think I rented the poster guy from Beta or whatever, or something like that. I didn't see it in theaters. And then that little girl, you know, the little blonde girl with the eyes of steel, you know, they're back, like they're here. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah. And then. 
I always had visions of, you know, growing up, again, I don't want to get into it, but I believed I saw Jesus, you know, in my closet for many years. And then I, I just have this theory in my head that, you know, um, I've seen aliens have been abducted. Again, there's probably a mental illness. But I, I have these thoughts in my head that maybe I was abducted growing up again. And then, you know, I told my mom all about Jesus. And I, get, I gave him word for word, like how he looked. And I wasn't going to church. So my mom was like, how did you know? And I'm like, he appeared in my closet. Yeah, that's a strange thing. That's a, a, a lot of people who, um, well, so I've read, a lot of people who have seen aliens, it, it, it seems like they appear to you as something that's comforting. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, dude. I thought it might have been a separate thing. You know, oh my God. Do you listen to Mysterious Universe? Uh-uh, I don't, I don't. I listen to football. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a it's an Australian podcast called Mysterious Universe. You have a fucking field day, man. They talk about aliens, cryptozoology, conspiracy theories, the whole nine. You know what? That, wow. You know what? I, I didn't want to research, you know, all my feelings of when I was younger, but um I literally had marks on my 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 head. I had a dent in the back of my head after I, you know, told my mother and all that about um my Jesus sighting or whatever. But now, yeah. that you, again, we don't know where that mark came from. Again, I don't know. Maybe I hit my head earlier in the day playing sports or something. I don't know. But it's just interesting that, you know, I told my mom word for word, supposedly what Jesus looked like and said and all that. And then after that, like, I, I ended up, like, seeing a ghost in an apartment, a little girl ghost in a, another apartment. Oh and again, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's all correlated or whatever, but it's just some amazing experiences back in the days. So, and that was around the time that was around the time that I saw like poltergeist. So that's Ooh, why that, that's why it scared the heck out of me because I think I had some of those visions around the time I started watching those movies, and that's why that movie just I I was for sure that I had a poltergeist or something in my house or around me or something. So that movie did me in. But then growing up, of course, I enjoyed the Freddy Kruegers. I, 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 I wasn't really into the gore horror where they would show gotcha. the body parts. I walked into a movie. I think it was called Frankenstein 3D one day. And it, like they gave me 3D glasses. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go watch Frankenstein 3D in 3D. And it was like a, a gore horror movie, like a Frankenstein gore type version. Uh, is that Andy Andy Warhol's Frankenstein? It might be that one, but there was like cutting scenes or of limbs or legs or putting a brain together or something. But it was in 3D and I literally walked out like I could not take it. Like seeing all the blood in the bed. I have a thing for blood like I, I don't do well when I see blood. I have the, the disease where I bleed a lot when I get cut. Like it continues. Oh bleeding. shit. I forgot the name of it. Yeah, so blood in me, it, it ain't a good thing. So, but yeah, that movie scared. Me. I walked out of that, and then you know, growing up, you know, I, of course, I saw a bunch of movies, but none of them stood out. And then all of a sudden, Scream came out, and that because I love Drew Barrymore, Scream came out, and so I specifically went to the theaters to watch that, and I went, "This is a good scary movie." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you flipped the script, man. I maintain. The first ten minutes of Scream are still absolutely petrifying. Yeah, no, I I will I will go in on that. I'm not a huge fan of that series, but definitely those first ten, ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened to me. So I kind of became a fan again. I go, wow, is you know the horror as good as this and, and and thrilling and scary? But again, it wasn't. And then a few years later, again, I I don't really care for horror. You know, there's a new horror movie every week, The Witch. Oh, man, The Witch is really good. I'm just saying, they, everything has a the in front of it. Yeah, the, sure. yeah, yeah. The Witch, the, you know, the the paranormal activity, the ring, the, you know, shut up. Shut up, I don't care. <laughs> the willies. The keyboard, the willies. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, so none of them really scared me or did anything, but I saw a couple of them. Like, I went to see The Blair Witch. I actually went to a promotional screening for the Blair Witch. Did you really? Yeah, they promoted it to like actors and celebrities and all that, and they were going to film the audience reaction. And they were gotcha. they were paying us like three hundred dollars if we made the commercial. Plus, we'd get residuals for a reaction commercial. Oh yeah, remember those? Those were big in the late nineties. Yeah, they sure were. Yeah, so I get this one called Blair Witch, and it says based on a true story. 
we get the little, you know, the paper that says about the movie, based on a true story, real film footage of a witch encounter, this and that. So I go into it reading that, and I'm like, oh, shit, it's real, you know, like, it's real. <laughs> That's what they want you to believe. So we go yep. in there, and they have cameras set out in the front, like, I guess, dark screen cameras that'll maybe film the reactions. So we're watching the movie, and then I'm just like, literally 20 minutes into it, I'm like, this is some really bad acting. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I looked to somebody next to me, it was some girl, and I go, this is really bad. This, there's no way this is real. And she goes, she goes, what do you mean? I go, it's like bad acting. She goes, yeah, because it's real. I go, there's no way it's real. So we're watching the movie. Then they do the stupid witch reveal in the corner. And, you know, and then everybody in the audience, ah, ah. I was like, what the <laughs> hell is going on? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of that, dude. Like, I, I, I actually like Blair Witch. I just, but this is where my conspiracy brain comes no, in. Totally, because, man. Like, no. I watch things in, like, Nowadays, like I try to find out if it's fake or real or if there's a lie behind it. But this is early on when I was starting to notice that type of stuff. That's why mm -hmm. the Matrix movie changed my life. And I saw it like 10 times in a day or as many times as I could in one day. But um, that's why I have a conspiracy brain. But again, I just noticed things like that. Like to get off a side topic, I was watching the movie The Sixth Sense. And, um, you know, the kid, uh, Haley Joel Osment, whatever. Great movie, Sixth Sense. Oh, yeah, man. I realized that the people were dead around him, like probably 40% into the movie, 30% in the movie, and it fooled 90% of the audience. But I figured it out 30% in, and I yelled it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, in the middle of the theater? <laughs> but people didn't understand it. They just thought it was a fat guy yelling. <laughs> They didn't put it all together because I didn't say it like, oh, I see he sees dead people or whatever. I go, I go, I go, they're all dead. I go, Bruce Willis is dead. <laughs> you know, people look at me and they're like, shut up, shut up. You know, let's watch the movie. So I'm watching it. Then they do the big reveal. And then everybody's oh, oh, gasping. Oh, my God. I was like, and then the one guy goes to me, you fucking said it, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been me. <laughs> oh, man. Sean Sean would have fucking went crazy. And then after the movie, dude, a couple of people noticed me, man. They were they were yelling at me. It's not like I gave up Darth Vader as his father, you know? Like what the uh, hell is going yeah. on? Yeah. <laughs> you right? Yeah. That's like that that's that's been a problem the last uh probably like I mean it's probably happened forever, but I remember when uh Star Wars came back with uh Force Awaken and people were just like coming out of the theater just talking about it. And you see people waiting in line like just like they look like they want to kill themselves because they know the fucking twist. Yeah, well that sucks, dude. You're waiting for it, you know. That's what happened to me in um was it Return of the Jedi when they said he was the father or was that Empire. Okay, so that was that's episode two, right? Wait, no, episode five. Forgive me. That's episode five. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I was literally in line for like that movie. And I remember somebody saying something, but I didn't think about it till you know, till later in life. I kind of remember. And I remember everybody was like yelling at this person. They were throwing, I think they had like juju beads or hot dogs in line and they were throwing <laughs> stuff at him. But I didn't understand it. I was so damn young. I think I was like four or five years old. But, um, but yeah, I remember that. But again... The minute Bruce Willis went to the hospital or to the kid and the kid picked up the covers and he's under the table, I think it was, with a sheet or cover or blanket or something, and he's breathing cold. Earlier in the movie, he said something about, he goes, when they're they're dead, I, it gets cold. That's what he, he says earlier in the yeah. film. He said yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a certain line about being cold with dead or something like that. He goes, I get what? cold. He goes, oh, that's what he says, I get cold or something when they're there. Or I get yeah. cold or something when they're there. That's definitely one of those movies where you kind of have, like, what you just, you know, what you just explained happened, where you kind of figured it out, like, early on, and a lot of people didn't because, uh, you know, I saw that movie, you know, when it came out, but I had a college class, like, five, six, seven years ago. Uh, it was a film study class, and we watched it, and... Uh... <laughs> I guess not everyone in the class. The, act, the actors never. I noticed they didn't talk to each other. Like the other actors right, in the right, room, right. like the, the the mother, Bruce Willis. They never really looked at each other. There was never any shots. 
with them together. Yeah, you know, and I'm figuring out this whole thing, and I listen to every word. Oh well, that see, that's the thing. I think a lot of people don't get that laser focused. So, like, in my, just just to finish my quick story, uh, we're watching the movie in class, and somebody, I guess, had seen it and not realized. Hey, maybe not everybody in the world seen this movie and did the same thing you explained. And I think the professor like was just like, "What the fuck." <laughs> <laughs> It's a good movie to rewatch. It's a good movie to rewatch. Yeah, yeah. look at all the. Uh, I think it was a red was the big thing in that, or was it yellow? It was red. Yeah, red doorknobs, red trunk, all that kind of shit. I love yeah. that. I love that hidden stuff, man. Yeah, um, that's it's, why it's again so cool. I'm in, I'm into conspiracies or whatever because I like to find the hidden truths. There are a lot yeah, of man. hidden things that is truthful that people don't yeah. they don't realize, man. Or how much stuff we don't know, you know? Correct. And just to end it, so that movie meant a lot to me. What was I talking about? Was Scream and then Saw came out, and that was like a puzzle movie, and I really enjoyed Saw like that yeah. one because it was a puzzle movie. That's kind of funny though because you said earlier how you didn't like gore when you when, when you were younger. Yeah, and then that's Saw the thing I like... didn't like about Saw. <laughs> that's the thing I did not like, but I loved the puzzle, you know, sure, yeah, no, with definitely. the gore of trying to free yourself or you know how to get escape. So there's a movie out. I don't know what it's called, but there's a new movie out with. Like, they got different levels, and there's food, and the food goes to different levels, and people have to live off the food or something. It's on demand right now. I can't remember what it is, but, like, they lowered this table full of, like, ridiculous amounts of food, like, through a vertical, like, apartment complex or housing complex. And, like, you basically pull what you want from it, and as it gets lower and lower, the people get poorer and poorer. Wow, that's that's kind of interesting. Then people well, on, like, level 50, maybe whatever food was left over it has been eaten by the time it gets to level 50, so now you're going to die because no scraps had landed, you know, to the people at level 50. Like, the oh, elite damn. eat all the food, and whatever's left over goes to level 2. Then they oh take whatever food they want from the leftovers, then the food goes back down to level 3. So it's like, how long will the food last? And then the and then I think every day you get dropped down to a different level, you know, Holy except, shit. except the elite people. It, it's an interesting concept. And I also... Yeah. What was that movie that just came out? The Purge. So I enjoyed The Purge as well. I love the idea of The Purge. I'm not into horror movies, but that idea of a one night to kill everybody was fantastic. But they ruined the first movie. How do you do a movie called The Purge where everybody can go out of their house and kill people and then you make the first movie in a house? <laughs> That's, that is my that has been my biggest my biggest issue with that movie is the more interesting story is the one happening outside and you're stuck in the house the whole time. Yeah, well, they're trying to make a scary movie. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I think that's why every sequel was like out on the streets. But I love the sequels. Yeah. When they finally went outside to the town, like that was, yeah. I haven't watched the latest one, the, the, what is it called, Purge 1 or whatever, I haven't watched. Purge 0. The first Purge, yeah. I think Purge 2 is one of the better modern revenge movies because Frank Grillo is carrying that movie on his back. Uh, Mike, it is has been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and chatting with us. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for for all your work and all in all the memories and nostalgia that you've uh, given everyone, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, and I appreciate it, man. You're a great group of guys, and even though the show is called like dumpster movies, <laughs> you guys definitely know your stuff, and you created a great and wonderful experiences for me, and a lot of memories and nostalgia, and I will forever be grateful. And everybody. That listens to this podcast, share it, like it, subscribe, give these guys the attention they deserve. They're doing a great thing, and be safe, and I love you all. So that's it. That brings our special two-part interview with Michael Ray Bauer to a close. You can head over to YouTube and check out Mike's channel, Hey Bauer. Then you can hop on over to Instagram, and you can follow Mike at Hey Bauer. And uh, hey, if you use Twitter or both, you can follow him at Michael Ray Bauer. You can also visit Mike's Cameo page where you can request messages and other types of uh, greetings from the man himself. Maybe for your friend who's feeling down in the dumps and needs a little pick-me-up with the state of things right now. Also, stay tuned next week for our special Stepfather's Day episode where we're reviewing, you guessed it, The Stepfather from 1987. 
And as always, head over to that Movie Dumpster Instagram because you're going to find the MD Guide there. And that's going to tell you everything you need to know about the upcoming releases we have going on. So stay tuned, Dumpster Dwellers. Hey, everybody. If you want some more bad movie goodness, you can check us out at MovieDumpsterPodcast.com. Subscribe to us anywhere you listen to your podcast. And make sure to leave us a five-star review if you dig the show because it helps us get out of the bottom of the dumpster and into more eardrums. Yeah, and if you're on the social medias, you can follow us at Movie Dumpster on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. There. All done. Can I go now? Yep, you're free to go. Oh, wait a minute. Don't forget this. What's that? This is a jar of Spivey's own miracle manure. But this batch is real different. You see, I mix this up special just for you. Yeah, I put in a few extra heapings of my uh, secret ingredient. So whatever you're using it for, It'll work extra good now. And if I ever need to come back for more? Oh, I don't think you'll be needing any more. <laughs> yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> I gotta go. 